Hello, how's everyone doing out there? Welcome, uh, welcome to Underworld Dreams in conversation. Having a bit of technical difficulty, we're just waiting for John Langan to join us here. Um, quite frankly, I'm just not sure what's uh, where John is. Uh, we had a great conversation yesterday evening in the sound check, so. Um, I hope John is doing well, and I do hope that he will be joining us. Uh, tonight's event is Underworld Dreams in Conversation. Um, John was gracious enough to help me launch the audiobook of Underworld Dreams, which is out now. And it's a great opportunity to celebrate his acclaimed book, Children of the Fang and Other Genealogies from Word Horde, which came out last summer. So they're both quarantine books. So we're both happy to have this opportunity to share them with you. Uh, John and I were planning on mixing up the format tonight anyway. Uh, John was going to be reading from Underworld Dreams, some of his favorite little bits. And I was going to be reading from Children of the Fang. So I might be John's understudy in more than just the reading if uh, if John doesn't connect with us and I'll try to I'll try to answer the questions that I had uh, ready for him. So um, yeah, how how is everyone doing out there? I know these are these are rough times. Uh, we're in the third we're in the third quarter. It feels like of uh, of lockdown of COVID. I hope everyone is staying sane and staying safe and doing the best that they can. So um, thank you for coming everyone. Again, for those of you just joining us, we're waiting for John um, John to come join, join us in the stream here. This is Underworld Dreams in Conversation. Uh, we're gonna be talking about Underworld Dreams and reading from it, and also from John Langan's acclaimed book, Children of the Fang. And we were going to be mixing up the format tonight in that I'm going to be reading some of my favorite bits uh, from Children of the Fang. Oh, here comes John right now. Um, hey, John, how are you? Hey, everybody. Yeah, we. Um, I took the opportunity to, uh, to roll the credits, intro introduce, uh, introduce the event, introduce your book, Children of the Fang. I was just getting ready to uh, act as your understudy and all the lines I'd been rehearsing. <laughs> excellent, excellent, because I have no idea what I'm doing, man. I, I, <laughs> this is your show. It's a role I was born to play. <laughs> John, how are you doing today? I was just uh, wishing everyone well in the, these, I feel like it's the third quarter of the uh, these COVID times. Everyone is, everyone is uh, anxious and, and restless and, um, and uh, eager for some good, some good escape. How, how have you been doing? Well, um, it's been tough, you know. I, I mean, like everybody else, you know. I'm, I'm just trying to hang in there and, and make it, uh, make it through day by day. Um, there have been some, I, I don't know, you know, bright spots, things that have happened. Um, uh, your book was was one of them, Underworld Dreams, and uh, I'm glad that we get a chance to to come here tonight and. Um, and celebrate it, um, and uh, and talk about some really great writers as well who are are worth uh, worth celebrating as well. Yeah, I'm really excited to talk about the, the with talk about all these things with you. As I was, um, uh, I told uh, the people who are watching that we were talking about some some of our favorite writers uh, last night in preparation. We were also talking about um, some writers that we've been reading uh, that were that we're excited about. Um, I'm really excited. I told them that <laughs> I'm really excited to be reading some of my favorite bits and and celebrate Children of the Fang with you. And thank you so much for um, helping me uh, celebrate Underworld Dreams. Um, 
how's uh how's it been going with how's your writing been going um during these times you mentioned you're having some some bright spots some not so bright spots let's focus on the bright how uh how in, how does writing go in these times well the the writing's kind of a it, it's a mixed bag i i mean um for a, a while in um i guess like march april you know when when things were really getting super bad into may um i found it really difficult to write anything um and and in part it was just um it was this feeling right that that we were just I think I, I said this somewhere else that it was like you know watching us watching the nation smashing itself in a ham in the face with a hammer you know and and just gleefully and um and that was really difficult and, and really frustrating to to watch and and you know you just man you just saw this collapse of of any kind of meaningful response to to covid um from the top down and um and that was really frustrating and frightening and depressing and and so it was really, um, I, I guess once I got done teaching, my school shifted to online teaching um, I, I just about a year ago, a little, uh, not quite, but but almost a year ago. And so once I got done um, online teaching, I, I really had to force myself um, to go sit out front with a book and read um, for, for kind of mental health reasons to, to just... Um, every day to just say, okay, I'm just going to force myself to sit here for an hour or two hours or whatever with a book and, and just take this in. And, th and that was actually really restorative in almost like, I, I think to myself, why should you have been so surprised? But I was surprised nonetheless, you know, I was, I was surprised to, to recover, to rediscover that kind of, of healing effect, I guess you could say that, that um, reading can have. Uh, no matter what it is you're reading, you know, there's terrible horror novels or whatever, you know, terrible things are happening to people and you're like, oh, <laughs> yes, this is now I feel better. Um, and that helped that helped as as well. That, that helped it for me to kind of recover um, and in terms of writing to kind of get more back on uh, back on track. Um, so, yeah, it, it was. Uh, it was slower going than I really um, that I really wanted it to to be at at this point, um, I am happy to say that my very first collection, Mr. Gaunt and Other Uneasy Encounters, which has been out of print for a while and copies sell for silly prices uh, on the internet, um, Word Horde Press, with whom I, I did Children of the Fang, they're bringing that back into print. And, and that should probably be um, be out this summer. Uh, oh, fantastic! Yeah, it'll uh, it'll be copy edited, newly copy edited because the original has a lot of terrible uh, uh, errors in it, and um, uh, hopefully we'll have a new story in it as as well. And um, and then in the fall, I think I'll have my fifth collection coming out, um, also from Word Horde, uh, which is called Corpse Mouth and Other Auto Autobiographies, um, and that will also have a new a new story in it. That's that's stuff that's um, uh, in some ways, more recent writing, um, a lot of the stories in it sort of connect tangentially to the fishermen as well. So, oh, this is this is exciting. This this is well, that's like chock full of great things going on, and uh, right right in the middle of Children of the Fang is 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 still reaching people and and doing great. Um, I know it is also up. Uh, congratulations! It is. Um, nominated for a Bram Stoker Award. We just, so thank you, thank congratulations you. on that recognition from the community and wishing you um, wishing you all the best with that. Um, thank you. Thank you. It's it's I'm 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 in a category with Kathy Koja. I mean I'm not in a category with Kathy Koja Kathy Koja, but you know like like my book and her book are are you know are uh, are are nominated for the the same award and that's that's mind blowing to me. You know it it, it there was um, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I used to work in a Walden books a million years ago when they had such things. And, and I remember putting her books on the shelf, you know, and, and uh, um, uh, here we, that, that just, it, it boggles my mind. It, it does feel like this great, um, this great unexpected blessing, this, this great good thing that I, I, I'm just delighted, uh, just delighted by. It's great that um, I, I think all of us writers in some way are, we take uh, we take inspiration from, or we take motivation from, our idols, our heroes, the people that we like, um, like that. Um, 
one of the things that I guess the first question I have for you or the first topic, um, it's sort of my interpretation of the name, or maybe I'm getting it from your liner notes, Children of the Fang and Other Genealogy. So at, at first, when I first heard the title uh, coming out, I'm like, Oh, what what are these what are these other genealogies? Are the children of the fang? Is it going to be children of the tooth? You know, I, I was excited all for right. uh, for for all the uh, the uh, monstrous uh, inclinations of that name, but from reading the notes, um, I interpreted and see that the way that this book came together, or at least the way that um, one way to mentally group these stories was by your inspirations that you, uh, in your notes, you give extensive notes, and you talk about the writers who have inspired you in the notes um, for each story. Um, so I guess the, first, the um, one inspiration that we share is the author, um, Jeff Ford. That's and um, Jeff is a great writer, a really distinct writer. And yeah, it was really eye-opening to me to see, um, wow, okay, this is a story that was, you know, this was inspired by Lovecraft, or this was inspired by King, and this was inspired by Jeff Ford. So one of the first stories I want to read a little bit from is um, with Max Barry in the Nearer Precincts. Um, sure thing. Because I just thought it was, uh, <laughs> what was that? <laughs> no, I said sure, sure thing. Yeah, I just thought it was really interesting how... Um, you know, there's a lot of things going on with this story, but how you were like, "Hey, yeah, this was gonna, this is, this is gonna be my Jeff Ford story," or this is gonna be, um, I wanted to write a story uh, in the style of Jeff Ford. Can you tell us a little bit about um, your perception of a Jeff Ford story and um, structurally what that mean that means for you for the Max Barry story and. Yeah, then we'll read a little bit from it. How's that sound? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Um, so Jeff Ford was one of these great discoveries I made um, after my younger son was born. Um, I should I should just confess right now, right, that um, the fantasy, the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, was the first uh, the first place to publish me. Um, and when I submitted my first story to them, it'd been a long time since I'd read them. Um, it was simply a matter of I had a long story and they were a venue that published long stories and, and they accepted me, you know. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, Gordon Van Gelder, you know, he's going to smite me. Um, and um, and so then after, you know, I, I, after they accepted me, especially, I was like, oh, man, I guess I better start reading this, you know. So um, so I subscribed to the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. And um, I built up quite a backlog because you know how it is, you know, your, your magazine subscriptions come in and you're like, sometimes you read them right away because you're like, oh, there's a story by Jeff Ford in it. And other times you don't. So after my son was born, um, he had baby acid reflux, as it turned out, what they what they used to call colic. And he had a really hard time sleeping, um, if, if, especially if he was lying down. So if I kind of held him in my in my arms, instead of sleeping for 45 minutes, he would sleep for maybe an hour, an hour and a half, you know? So I would sort of sit there with him and I was like, I'm trapped. What am I going to do now? And I was like, well, <laughs> got all those old issues of FNSF. I guess yeah. it's time to crack them open. And that was how I discovered a number of writers and Ford was one of them. Mm -hmm. And I read stories like Creation and stories like The Honeyed Knot. And I was just blown away. And ironically, you know, I, I, I have said since then that I'm I'm kind of relieved I hadn't read FNSF before I um a bit before I submitted to it because if I had I never would have because mm -hmm. Jeff's fiction and M Rickard's fiction and Lucia Shepard's fiction and Alex Irvine's fiction and Del Bailey's fiction it was all so astonishingly good it was incredibly intimidating and and it was just I was kind of lucky to just find out that I had I had um I had gotten in there and 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 then to read it and be like oh my god this is this is what I got into so um one of the things that I really admire about Jeff is the, the utterly protean nature of his of his fiction you never know what you're going to get with the Jeff Ford story and um it's one of the delights, um, and he, he one of the delights of, of reading him. And there's this thing that Jeff does where, where he takes kind of late 19th century ways of telling stories um, 
And he just is like, yeah, we're going to use this. This is what we're doing. And then he tells whatever story he wants to, to tell with that. And I really admired that. And I was really kind of eager to just try to write a story like that where something just happens, you know, like, like you're just kind of plopped into the middle of, of um, a kind of frame narrative, I guess, that, that feels like it's part of an ongoing story. Ford is really good at, at doing that, at, at giving you this sense. Um, and, you know, it's, it's funny. Ford has said that he really admires uh, Isaac, Isaac Bashevis Singer's work. Mm. And um, Singer's work can have that feeling too, you know, that, that there's a, uh, like the, there's a narrator who presumably is singer and somebody knocks on the door and is like, are you the writer? And he's like, yeah. And the guy's like, I've got a story for you. And he comes in and he sits down. <laughs> and, you know, and, and I said, and, and so the, and there's this, this kind of feeling for me with, with Ford, you know, like that, that, that that's uh, his stories. It's not that they all take place in, in the same universe, but the, but it, within this kind of Fordian sensibility or, or something like that. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I, I wanted to kind of, you know, sneak in, <laughs> sneak into Jeffrey's backyard and be like, hey, you know, before he turned on the lights and came out with the dog and the shotgun. <laughs> Maybe minus the shotgun there, Jeff's the nicest guy you're, you're ever going to meet. But, um, yeah, it's it's fascinating to me because um, at a simplistic level, I simply call it the story within the story or the framing device. Like, yeah, like it, it's. It seems to have, whether it was um, a Besheva Singer thing or uh, a Time's Gone thing, yeah, in the Jeff Ford story, or maybe in this, this, this kind of story, that there's a story going on, and one character will turn to another and be like, yeah, and that, that's, that's when he, uh, he traveled to the, uh, to the afterlife. Oh, really? Yeah. And this is what happened. Pan, pan, and yeah, then boom. Yeah. And, um, yeah, there's a lot to talk about that. I do want to read a little bit from that, but um, you know, it dawns on me, um, you do it in a much smoother way. Um, we're here to talk about short stories, but in, in your acclaimed novel, The Fisherman, there's what I perceive as being the stories within the stories. Like there are uh, stories within the larger narrative that are about characters in that narrative that shed light on it. And it's just... Um, yeah, whatever, whatever you call it, 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 it's downright fun. So I guess I'll, I'll start off. I'm just gonna read, just gonna read like two pages, just a little taste of sure. um, with Max Barry in the near precincts, and then then we'll come back and we'll, we'll talk more about your influences and about the story here, if I can remember how to. Um, okay, so we don't have to look. Okay, this is with Max Barry in the near precincts from Children of the Fang by John Langan. None of us should have been should have been surprised. If anyone could have been expected to find his way back, it was Max Barry. Hadn't he spent the last three quarters of a century investigating the murky terrain just the other side of this life? Hadn't one of the three of us accompanied him for the last two decades as he roamed the country, searching out and interviewing those who had ventured the margins of existence? Hadn't we entered those accounts into Barry's massive archive, properly cross-referenced, of course, and helped him coordinate the information he received to arrange it practically a map of the undiscovered countries near our precincts? With almost the final breath his failing lungs could muster, Barry promised us at least a sign, not so original a pledge, perhaps, but one weighted by the accumulated years of his research. And yet, when myself, Torres, and Schaefer were the recipients of not just a sign, but the presence of the man himself, our combined reactions might have been lifted from the most formulaic horror film we had gathered around the oak table in the study, as we did every Thursday evening. With Barry a fortnight in the family and mausoleum behind the house, there was little reason for the three of us to be there. But while we had been more than diligent in the work we performed for him, the quality of our efforts owed itself less to any shared passion for the subject and more to the generous paychecks he signed every other week. That and the force of his personality, which had the effect of a powerful magnet on a scattering of iron fillings, snapping them into alignment with itself. 
While his will appointed us trustees of his estate at salaries every bit as comfortable as those we had drawn as his assistants, and while that document allowed and encouraged us to use a substantial portion of the Barry fortune to extend his research absent Max's presence, the offer held scant interest for us. Although we had spent the first meeting after his death in reminiscences of Max and half the second in gossip, we continued to gather in the study with its thick green carpet and heavy black curtains from an obscure sense of loyalty, a desire not to allow the project of a man's life to end mid-sentence, but to bring the paragraph to a full and complete stop. We hadn't any notion how this was to be done, whether the archive, for example, might find a home at a sympathetic university, or whether one of the other of us might write the account of our experiences in Barry's employ, or even whether we might hire a new, younger group to continue the task of exploring the other side by proxy. But I believe we felt that if we carried on our meetings, eventually the solution to our dilemma would present itself. There were two empty chairs at the table that night, the one usually occupied by Barry, and the one which frequently went unoccupied, but occasionally sat a guest Barry had invited. It was in this second, typically vacant chair that Max Barry suddenly sat. If I were to attempt to justify the screams that erupted from Torah Schaefer's string of oaths, my start up from my seat, although it would be an appeal to Barry's appearance. Anyone who has been in the presence of a corpse knows the fundamental difference of the dead, their utter stillness, the lack of barely perceptible motions through which life percolates out of us. Although it wore his favorite suit, white shirt and black tie, the figure that sat in our midst was as motionless as it had been in its coffin. Because of its slackness, the face was at first unrecognizable to me. It was the work of some seconds to identify the large round nose, the long forehead, the lips that always seemed too thin for the wide mouth. Had the eyes been open, I might have fitted the pieces of the puzzle more quickly, but they were and remained throughout his visitation closed. Once I assembled its components into Barry's large, plain face, however, and understood who it was beside me, a rush of pure terror caused me to shove my chair back into a treat to the couch, which I almost fell over. Torres found her voice before the rest of us. Max? Mr. Barry? The figure's mouth dropped open like that of a ventriloquist dummy. The voice that issued from it was unmistakably Barry's broad, pleasant one, but it sounded off as if it had been poorly recorded and played on a stereo with a shorted speaker. Mr. Torres, it said, Mr. Schaefer, Mr. Anderson. Mr. Barry, Schaefer and I said. You've returned, Torres said. Yes, the figure said. Did I not say I would? Torres stuttered an answer. The figure, Barry said. It is all right, Miss Torres. You are right to be skeptical. It has ever been your role in our little group. How are you? Schaefer said. I still am, Mr. Schaefer. What about you, Mr. Anderson? Do you have no words for your old employer? The note of familiarity, familiarity in that strange voice made my bowels clench. My mouth was dry. I licked my lips and said, What can you tell us? Very good, Barry said. Very good. I am not sure how much time I will have with you, so I'll try to be direct from the beginning then or the end. And then uh, I'll stop it there because that's the, that's, the, that's the frame. And at that point on, I'm, I'm telling uh, those, those, um, those of us who haven't read the story yet, it is the account of, of Mr. Barry in, in the afterlife and we, we, we follow him. So it's that story within the story that... Um, there, there's a story going on of like, oh, there are these 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 people and their bosses back from the dead and in their chair. But then there's also the story of um of that guy in the afterlife. So yeah, it's just a cool, it's a cool structure. It's one that um that Jeff Ford um does a does a lot. Um anything else you want to tell us about that story? Where how did the um the idea from the plot, not just the structure, come to you, John. Well, it's it's. I mean, there's 
a few things actually. Uh, um, so part of it, part of what I was thinking about with um, with Jeff is is that he's very interested in in this kind of nineteenth century kind of way. I feel like in people who just do like yeah. weird pursue like weird avocations. You know, he he's so I, I thought the idea of a bunch of of sort of um, psychic investigators or a a rich psychic investigator with his his team. You know, like that seemed to me something that Jeff would would really get behind. You know. Um, except I think in a Ford story, it would have been more about the whole team interacting as opposed to like, he would give you like several stories of what happened before this moment. Right. Um, and then when the guy gets to the afterlife, um, I, I, I looked into like ancient Sumerian mythology and, and sort of, um, uh, near Eastern stories. And, and I was, I was trying to do something different from either say the Greeks or the Romans or, or the Vikings, right. The, you know the, the sort of big usual um, uh, mythologies that that people tap into. Um, it was written for the the book was written. The, the, I'm sorry, the story was written for a book called After Death, which was edited by Eric Guignard. And the whole idea was that the stories had to touch on in some way what happened after death. And I was just like, no, we're going all the way into into uh, death and into what what's lurking there. Um, the the kernel of the idea actually came from. Um, and I mentioned this in the story notes in the book, it came from a teeny, teeny story that Mary Rickert, M. Rickert wrote, someone else from my FNSF reading. Um, Mary and I were asked to participate in this uh, uh, very early on, like 2007, I think it was, um, for, for me and my career, such as it was, um, to, to participate in this um, event for this ma uh, weekend uh, uh, news program on uh, uh, American Public Radio. And um, they asked, they wanted us to come up with 30 second horror stories. Um, yeah. Sure, easy, right? <laughs> so, um, man, you know, I, I labored over it and I came up with a couple um, that I included. I came up with three and I included a couple in the um, in Children of the Fang and the story notes. Mary came up with this one that I just loved. And it was about um, how how ghosts, when you when you see the light, that's actually that that's a light that destroys you. Go away from the light, you know? And that really sort of sparked my imagination. Well, what is the light? Why is the light so bad? And and um, so you know what took Mary like you know under thirty seconds. I spent like you know fifty pages you know elaborating on. Well, here's what's going on in the light. Um, so yeah, that was. Um, I, and I think in in terms of um, like my kind of process, I I, I guess like I, I was just exploring this place. You know, I I, I just kept thinking, well. Well, what's next here? And some of it, some of it, um, there's um, the, there's a, um, a a sort of a weird staircase, and there was some weird kind of brick structures. Um, those uh, those were some I, actually they came out of a dream. They came out of this strange dream I had. They were just like these yeah. details, and I was just like, well, why not put them in? But um, some of the other stuff was um, had it just came out of research. Came out of um, um, came out of uh, just reading about these these stories that I really knew nothing about, um, and it was it was a lot of fun actually. It was it was great fun, and and in in my mind it, it was um, like I'd love to see someone illustrate this story because uh, uh, the, there are all kinds of crazy visuals in this story that I just I really love thinking about, you know. And and it's funny, you know, because I usually I do a lot of doodling, and every now and again I'll doodle stuff from my stories, but I've I've never really doodled anything from these from this story. Mm -hmm. and I, I, I should, yeah, yeah. There's a lot um, that really struck me about the story. Um, it really it really has a gravity to it. <laughs> no pun intended, because a lot of the story is Max going deeper and deeper into this afterlife per se, and um, it's like a ruined afterlife. I don't want to give away the story, but uh, yeah, absolutely, yeah, and and but yeah, you, you do get the sense of. Um, um, it's still Aikman-esque in that you don't know exactly what's happening because there's a lot of detail going to the number of stairs and the level and the number of stairs. There's a sense right, of right. there's a sense of the depths and there's a sense of where he's viewing these dreamlike uh, afterlife cityscapes from a distance and then coming into them. And he learns he learns basically what's happened or what's happening as we the reader do. And in many ways, that is a Jeff Ford. Um, that is a hallmark of the Jeff Ford story. Um, uh, I was fortunate enough. I took a, I took Jeff's class. He gave a workshop. Um, I know he teaches in Ohio, but he was in New York 
this is already pre-COVID times in 2019, and he uh, he gave a writing workshop, and I, I just could not pass up the opportunity. I've always wanted to um, take a class to to learn from Jeff, and um, I was just so surprised. It's like what you you started out the show by saying, like, oh, when I was rest the restorative power of reading, I, I shouldn't have been surprised. But I was surprised at how much good that did to me when I when I learned what Jeff was teaching us, or when I listened to his teachings. It, it felt the same way, like oh, I should I should have known that I should have known that Jeff would say that. But yet I was so surprised. Like Jeff's stories have so much weight and they're so masterful to me. It surprises me how organic a method goes into his writing, or to what he was teaching the students. He was like, oh yeah. Writing is easy. You just pick a character and then you follow him. <laughs> it's as simple as that. And right. I'm like, of, of course. The, I think the missing ingredient is if you're Jeff Ford, you know, if you have that nuclear submarine powered imagination <laughs> right there, he's like, look, I'll do it right now. And he starts to, talking about a witch and a bird and a thing. And they're like, oh, well, let's, let's, let's see where that goes. You know, it, it, quite, uh, quite magical. Um, my other. Uh, Jeff was really inspirational to me when I, I was first getting started. Um, I, I I saw him read. Uh, I went to see him read with Gavin Grant. Uh, Gavin Grant was like, hey, Dan, let's go check out this writer. He's great. This is in the summer of 2002. Oh, it wow. August, it was August 2002. And it was a venue in New York that I don't think it exists anymore. It was, I think it was part of it was a New York Review of Science Fiction readings either in a performance space or a church space that no longer exists. But uh, there is Jeff Ford, and I hadn't read a word of him. This is, and there's Jeff. He's just, he's a character, and he has his voice, and he has his accent. And uh, so many of his characters, to me, blur the line between, in the most fantastic of ways, they'll blur the line between reality and fiction. In that so many of his stories are grounded in the earth that we know. So this story that I'm thinking of, he read a, a story, A Night in the Tropics. Do you remember yeah, this yeah, one, the story, A Night in the Tropics? The one about and the bar, yeah. The one about the bar and like these, these, these guys who are just like, you could have gone to high school with them. They're going to do this little heist and it becomes a heist gone wrong. But then the story folds over on itself and it was magic. I'm like, who... Who is this? Is he telling? I'm like, is he telling the truth? Like he, had, it had such between Jeff's voice and his delivery and the, and the his skill on the story. Like after he was done, I was like, hey, did that did that happen? And, you know, he's like, nah, man. You know, it didn't. That, that's not true. But uh, that bar, that you know, Jeff will tell you what parts, what little parts, yeah, of yeah, it, uh, yeah, are true. Like you know, he, he he has fun being like. No, that's not true. But that guy was like my uncle Billy, and oh my God, he used to steal comics. With you know, he would like tell you the little nugget of right, right, <laughs> of truth. Yeah, in there, no, so. I, it was the same thing uh, when I read the Honeyed Knot, which which was just an early uh, an early masterpiece. I, I feel like for Jeff or of Jeff's, and and yeah, I I I love that I love that way you phrased it. You just sort of folded the story over that that there's yeah. something there's something that Jeff can do. He doesn't always do it. But he can do where he just sort of pulls the story inside out right. and, and over. Watch his hand. Watch his hand. You think it's a story about this, but then one detail that you remember that be becomes suddenly becomes important, and you're like, "Oh shit, the story's about this." Yeah. You know, without without being a gimmick, like it's so smooth. You know, it's 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 so smooth. Um, there may be something too. You know, it's it's funny. Um, th this thought just occurred to me as you were saying. You know. Jeff's like, just follow a character. It's easy, you know. But <laughs> one of the things for for anybody who's watching, who is a, a writer, or I guess maybe who, who, who aspires to to publish their stuff, you know, who is writing now, that I, I think maybe part of part of writing, part of what you're doing is like you're sort of learning how you write. You're sort of learning what your process is. So. Um, you know, Jeff, I don't know how long he's been doing this for. I'm, I'm guessing somewhere in the order of about 40 years. Um, there's a way in which, like, Jeff, you, you would think he should be able to do that, you know? And maybe that's not fair, but, but like, it, it, he has had so much practice at, at doing this that um, 
and and I think for for anybody who hasn't had a lot of practice or as much practice, it can feel like, oh my God, I'll never be like that. And this guy's, I mean, he is a genius, don't get me wrong, but he's also, I think, like he's further along the road as a as a writer than you are if you've only been writing for a little while. So that like if he's able to it seemingly pull things out of a hat, it, it's because he's worked at that for a long, long time. And at some point when you've been doing this for 40 years, some newbie, you know, as it were, will look at you and be like, oh, my God, how do they do it? They make it look so easy. Yeah. It's like, well, after 40 years, you know. Yeah, John, I want to say something right along the lines of that. Like, uh, I forgot when when you met, you had mentioned, oh, how you were almost intimidated by those people in fantasy and science fiction. I feel that all the time when I read great work, when I read your work, when I read Jeff's work, Kelly Link's work, Tanith Lee's work. And what I, uh, what I want to say to people out there who may aspire to write is, okay, feel your feelings. You're going to feel that, but then let it power you and let it just, you know, yeah, uh, we're never going to write as good as Tim Powers or uh, or Kelly Link, but you can aspire to to let that motivate you. I, I'm not, it's not, it's coming across all clunky, but I hope, I hope that um, people who feel that feeling that you're talking about don't ever really get discouraged when you're done feeling discouraged, let it let, go back and hit and, and hit, hit the, hit the books again. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. I have a copy of Jeff's forthcoming book here. Big, dark, uh -oh. big, dark hole. Um, just want to have a shout out to this book. It's going to be out in July. It was supposed to be out now, but this is just an arc. Um, have you read um, the title story yet, Big Dark Hole? No, no, I haven't. Uh, I haven't. Uh, it's not, I mean, it's out. It was out in a couple other places, but I had an opportunity to hear him read it uh, a year or two ago, and it's one of my favorite Jeff Ford stories, even by that high Jeff Ford, uh, high Jeff Ford standard. So. Um, yeah, if you're a fan of Jeff Ford's, pre-order this from the Fantastic Small Beer Press, or, or if you're looking for something new and you're looking for something that's really going to challenge you and delight you, um, check out some Jeff Ford. Anyone out there? Um, this this is his newest. Um, yeah, and something. One more thing. I, I I'm just thinking about like. Um, yeah, I, I read Kelly Link, and I'm like, how did she do that? Right, someone else whom I associate with with Jeff Ford. Right, is this? Yeah, sort of a, you know, high wire artist of, of one one of a kinds, both one of a kinds. Yeah, and and the I'm trying to think of the right. I, 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 it's difficult to articulate this, but I think what I want to say is is that like I will never uh, I will never write. Um, as good a Kelly Link story as Kelly Link can write. And I will never write as good a Jeff Ford story as Jeff Ford can write, right? And that's true for all of us, right? That that we we read, you know, when I was a kid, I mean, I remember reading Peter Straub and being like, I love this, but holy cow, man, you know, how am I ever gonna? And, and I, I think all, like what's incumbent on you is to discover the kind of story you can write and then to write the best version or the best, you know, the best types of, of that story possible. So, so that, you know, the, the kinds of narrative acrobatics, the kind of techniques we're talking about here of, you know, where the story seems to be pulled inside out and this sort of stuff that you see um, Kelly do and that you see Jeff do, oh, it's seemingly effortlessly, but it, it, whether it is or not, um, those may not, I don't think those are the kinds of things that I can do as a, as a writer. Um, it's not to say that I don't try to sort of, you know, sneak things in, but there are other things that I can do, like those endless stories within stories, right? And, mm -hmm. um, and so if that's the case, then I try to, I try not to be static, like I keep try, I keep trying to push myself forward, but I think as a, um, as a writer, you know, you can, you can still, even if you're not going to be Kelly Link, well, you know, there is a Kelly Link uh, and right. she's wonderful. You know, there's a, there's a Jeff Ford and he's a great guy, right. a great writer, but, but we have them already. What it's we almost need... cliche to be the same, be the best John Lang and that you can be, yeah. but it's not, but it's not, it's cliche, but it's also not cliche because it's like, Oh, um, you know, someone once said to me, um, Oh, okay. This is a story of a kind. Like, I guess pe some, some people in, um, some of my beta readers, like, oh, we've read this Dan Brahm story before. We've read it, but um, there's uh, there's there's something to be said about doing the best 
your story that you can do. And, and I guess that's what I mean when I say, oh, damn, I'm never going to write a Kelly Link story. But I'll keep writing that damn Rob story till it's the it's 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 my it's the it's 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 till it's my uh, uh I was almost about to say status quo my state of the art you know you'll keep writing that no no one can write that John Langan story and you're gonna keep maybe you're gonna come back to some themes maybe you're gonna come back to things that you visit but you're just gonna write um, better is is the wrong word but you're gonna keep you're gonna keep on that John Langan j journey and uh, and that's what you're here for. Yeah, and I would I would certainly say too, you know, that if you if you read um, Jeff's stuff, um, if you read Kelly's stuff, if you read anybody's stuff, you are going to find that every writer has their obsessions, and I think it's it's actually can be really useful to write to your obsessions sometimes to to go into those obsessions, um, and and to see where they lead you, um, because uh, sometimes our obsessions are they're so big, they're so they're so vast that we can get kind of lost in them in a, in a good way, you know, that, that you can just, um, uh, you know, it's like Faulkner talking about his, his little postage stamp of soil, um, his, his little hometown that he spins into all these, all these novels and, and stories. There's, or, or I suppose King has done something similar with, with, um, with Maine, with his, his section of Maine in, in particular, it's, it's finding your, Whatever it is, whatever your obsession is, I mean, in the case of those writers, it's it's kind of geography, but it doesn't have to be necessarily. So, okay, um, hey, before um, next up on our program, you're going to read you you've picked something out from Underworld Dreams. I have indeed. Hey, read uh, before we hit before we hit that, uh, John. Are there any bookstores? Um, I just wanted to mention a couple of independent bookstores that have Underworld Dreams. Um, Books Inc. in Berkeley, California, uh, the Green Hand Bookstore in Maine, and the Book Bin in uh, Oregon are a couple. Are there any book uh, indie bookstores that carry your books um, that you can give a shout out to? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Inquiring Minds. Um, they have uh, they have a, um, two stores: one in in New Paltz, New York, and the other in Saugerties. Uh, in fact, I don't know. About a month ago, they called me and they and they said. Uh, Oh, we hope you don't think we're weird, but we have some of your books. Would you mind coming in and signing them? And I oh, was like, weird. What, what a blessing, what right? What are you talking about, you know? Um, I have not been, uh, The Golden Notebook, which is um, uh, uh, the, bo the bookstore in Woodstock and Main Street in Woodstock, um, has has had uh, The Fisherman. I don't know if they have my most recent stuff because I haven't been in there in a, in a while, but they're a fantastic bookstore. And, and so I'm always happy to, to give a shout out to them as well. And... Um, you know, as speaking of Kelly Link, uh, I, I mean, she and uh, and uh, Gavin book, Grant, her book partner, moon, have, book moon. Yep, have Book Moon, and and they um, um, they're a full service bookstore as well. You know, any of these places, they they pay attention, man. Yeah. You know, they, they they pay attention to to what's um, what's out there, and uh, and they give good recommendations. So, yeah. and they support they support the small presses. They support guys like. Jeff and me and everyone else, and they really can. They really can. We want them to still be here when we're ready to go out into the world again. So yeah, I'm going to turn it over to you, John. You're going to you can introduce the story, I'll, and I will bring you back to dual screen after just a couple of pages here. Alrighty. Hey, everybody. Great. Dan isn't here now. <laughs> so this is uh, um, this is a story called Between Our Earth and Their Moon. Um, and it's from uh, from Underworld Dreams. Um, and I'll just read the first couple of pages. I was just getting to the best part of the story of the man who met himself, and Claudia was indulging me when the guy with the hard hat interrupts us. I got a special kind of problem, he says. I hear you're the one who can help. Claudia's eyes light up the way they do when she spies a mark. I know I should turn on the charm and hustle up some work, but all I can think about is finding a way to feel okay again. I've been pouring my heart out to Claudia all afternoon, telling her that if I could do it all over, live my life differently, I would. I'd do anything. I thought finally getting some recognition around here would make me happy, but I'm the same old me. Maybe stronger and smarter, yeah, and with a few more tricks up my sleeve, but... I still feel alone in a world that feels colder every day. The guy keeps his poise even though I don't answer him. The din from the tables full of hipsters and posers and even a few real practitioners feels the silence between us. 
Claudia clears her throat and stands there fanning her order pad. She's wearing the black apron, black slacks, and black shirt the waitstaff wear, even though she's not one of them. The conversation at the next table over lulls as the wannabes take a break from sipping expensive coffees and cooing over their old books and posing and showing off to try and listen in. I've had it. I've had enough with the attention, but this guy isn't one of the ordinary gawkers. With his clipboard and bright orange work vest, I thought he was just another workman when I spied him leaving Maria Elena's chambers. I should have known better. The man's talking to you, Nate, Claudia says. Looks like he might be a paying customer. But this is Maria Elena's place. Maria Elena's town. Everybody knows all jobs must go through her or there's trouble. I don't want any trouble. Claudia's fondness for me has made her reckless. Who's asking? I finally say and look up to face him. His thinning hair only has a hint of brown left in it. The dim light makes the lines in his middle-aged face look even deeper than they probably are. Grant Donovan, he says. Union chief. National 625. The Sandhogs. We shake hands. National? You've come a long way, I say. It's all relative, he says. Claudia blows a strand of her blonde dyed bangs out of her face, goes back to waiting tables. It's the ship part of the otherwise sweet position she has. Donovan sits without asking. Hard day in the tunnels, I say. Maybe one of these days you guys are going to finish that crosstown line. I'll let you ask again once you've taken a shift drilling solid bedrock. There's an uncomfortable silence. I hope I haven't run him off. Claudia is right. I do need money. He unclips papers from his clipboard. Uh-uh. I say, around here, all jobs go through Maria Elena. Of course, he says. I only want to show you that my union has a contract, but it hasn't been honored. In my book, that's a green light. A green light for trouble, I say. The city's full of practitioners who'll do any work for a buck. This is a sensitive matter. I don't want just anyone, he says. You are as good as they say, right? Claudia returns and slaps two menus on the table. Of course he is. How much does it pay? A lot, Donovan says. I appreciate the offer, I say, but no. No reason to waste any more time, then. There are things, things in my tunnel stopping my machines from running. I thought that would interest you. He stands and places a business card on the table. There's that, he says, if you wise up and change your mind. I watch him walk out the door. Don't let him go, Claudia says. He offered you a real job. He's nothing but trouble, I say. I can spot it. She looks at me like I'm an idiot. The world of the arcane is more than status and position in this fancy place Maria Elena has set up. Claudia hasn't learned this yet. On the last real job I took, everything burned, and a young girl, not terribly unlike her, got killed. So I'm not an idiot, no matter what she thinks. I'm learning. I'm finally learning. And I'll stop there. Oh wow, you're a good reader, John. Thanks. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So, so tell us about this. I mean, what a great, like, sort of hard-boiled beginning, you know? Like, it's got that real noir kind of kind of feel to it. The the guy who's just come through some really something bad, you know. And and there's 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 a couple of things right that are said there that they make much more sense once you've read the story. They take on a double meaning. Um, yeah, yeah. It's so it's a hard thing to do, right? To make um, it's a standalone story, but um, it's also a piece in a much larger story. Like these are, there's a lot going on in the story because there's recurring characters, and in many ways, it, it's not a direct follow-up. But in my first collection, uh, the Night Marchers and Other Strange Tales, uh, there's a short story called Across the Darien Gap, which is the shit that that guy has just gone through. Um, right, like, right. You know, that's, there's a prequel to that, but what I was um, you know, you mentioned the hard boiled and the noir and um, yeah, that's like, you know, it's a great thing to, um, to know structure. I mean, I, when I started writing, I didn't even know what the word noir meant until, you know, someone, someone used it like in connection with something I'm like, Oh, what is that? But then once, um, once you become a more grown up writer and you're like, okay, you learn that you learn about, I like learning about structure and I love being a student of structure and a student of form and genre, not to necessarily write in them, but to know how to help a story 
to know how to sub and to know how to subvert a story so it free it can free you up to do other reasons like um yeah so you can like in a noir story there's there's always um there's always a, there's, there's some familiar shapes like yeah the guy who wants out who's gonna buy the farm right there's right. the guy who's <laughs> who's always down on his luck and been through hell there's okay there's a hard-boiled detective and a client walks in or in a more uh, uh, or a dame walks in or something like that a, a job walks in you right. know there's and uh, so there, there's always these structures um, where it the structures free can be freeing in that way like the constraints of expectation can be freeing because you can tell you can tell an external story like okay this is a story about a guy who's hiring a supernatural detective to rid his job site of ghosts, right? So that's like, that's the external story. But the thing that I play around with is um, perhaps in the weird fiction or in the strange story um, where the supernatural isn't necessarily what you think it is. Okay, like in a vampire story, we must cut off its head and bury it in the crossroads. So then the story, the story becomes about that. But when when the the supernatural isn't necessarily a ghost or isn't that the story there's much more room to tell to tell something else and what you were talking about the things having the double meaning what seems like just so, sort of a throwaway line like yeah there's just there's a man who met himself or you just you think it's just a story the story becomes about different moral choices as as the mystery is unraveled this supernatural detective has um, has choices that he can make, and and there it becomes becomes much more of a moral play. So yeah, that was um, that was one of the things I wanted to also explore in the story. It was like, yeah, what if you, what if you met yourself? Like, what are the moral implications of encountering yourself? Like, how can that how can that be embodied in a story? So yeah, those are some of the ideas I was trying to to throw into the mix and. Um, Hopefully, it came out in a cake shaped like a story. <laughs> <laughs> what, um, so, what was the? Did you write this for? Was a call for submissions, or was this just an idea that was kind of kicking around in your head, or, or? You know, it was it was just it was just kicking in my kicking in my head. Um, I rarely, I yeah, really, I rarely write the submissions. I rarely get invited to things. Big surprise, uh, but. Um, uh, I think I think I sat down to write pen to paper. I had a I had a different story where um, okay, so the creatures in the book aren't ghosts. They're these things that they call them moonlings. They're basically these creatures from an alternate universe, Earth, that somehow are interacting with this story. I had those things in another story, just like they were just in a completely different, non-related story, and I was like. Yeah, I want those. I want those things. <laughs> I want those things to somehow be be in a story as well. So I think that was like the um, right. You, then you just you you weave you weave a world. You weave dramatic structure around to support the elements that you want to put in the story. Sometimes. So that was like another um, you know. And, and I also I love um, Kelly Link. Um, I heard her. I heard her speak a few times, but she she has such fascinating theories on inspiration and structure. And she was telling a group of, of her listeners, readers one day, she was just asking, asking the audience, like, what's the thing in a story where you're always, you're always out? Or what's the thing in the story where you're always in? Like, okay, stories where the dog gets hurt. I'm always out. I'm never reading it. What's the story that where you're, oh, you're always in. And, um, you know, I love stories about plans going wrong. I love story and I love stories where people are wrong, you know? So like this was like a, in many ways, a big fake, like, Oh, this is going to be a story about ghost hunting, but everyone, everyone's notions about what's happening in the story are revealed to be not accurate. And, you know, in a way, sometimes that says that might say something about the supernatural in our world. Like um, how many things out there do we think are ghosts, but are, maybe things of this earth or maybe things not of this earth that we can't even imagine. So, you yeah, know, no, what's fascinating to me is that the story, because it deals with, with, um, 
those other kinds of realities, let's say, um, uh, on other Earth. That you know, and at the beginning of the story, of course, the guy is thinking about changing his reality. You know, metaphorically leading a new life. You know, and and one of the things I think the the story does as as like it's one of the cool things you can do in the fantastic, right? Is it, it takes the metaphor and it makes it literal. It, it's like, well, let's suppose this is the case, you know, like, like what if, what if you really can change your life? What if, what if there really is um, another, another place for you to be? Um, and I, I think it just does that really, it does that really well. And I, I think, you know, what you were saying about like sort of kind of moral choice, I, I, I think that that, um, um, John Gardner um, said it at some point, I think it was his last published book uh, on moral fiction, which got him in a lot of hot water. But he, he made this kind of interesting argument to me, which was that fiction was about choice and its consequences. And to that extent, he argued fiction is like inherently moral because it shows that you make a choice and there are consequences. It's not like, oh, I made a choice and there are good, a good choice for good consequences. No, the most interesting stories are about bad choices and terrible consequences. But, but I do think um, that's something that, that um, the, the kind of crime or noir story is sort of fascinated by. And, and, um, and honestly, some of the best fantasy and horror is, is obsessed with too. Although I'm not always sure that we, not always sure that we recognize that, you know. Um, um, especially in horror, I think I think people mm -hmm. think that horror is like choicelessness. You know, the monster gets you. You know, but it's like, well, yeah, there's all, there's so many different. Yeah, there are so many different kinds. I mean, yeah. I never even. I, I think what I think all these things that you're saying are, um, are are fantastic. Like for me, it was just how I learned how I learned how to write character. Like I'm so preoccupied with setting and speculative elements that the last thing that came to me as a writer was writing good characters. Like often my, my early stories would be just, that would be the thing that was absent. And um, I just learned for me, and it's not, there's no one way to do it, but for me, like I learned plot, I learned the plot, plot is character and character is conflict and conflict is having choices whether whether which way you go right or left, and so like I think in a lot in a lot of my stories, you will see characters that that have that have choices. That's just like um, it turned out to be a good crutch, but I think it was just a crutch, you know, well, it's, in, in it's, ways like yeah. And it's interesting, you know, like like I'm thinking back, circling back to Jeff Ford's remark about you know just take a character and follow him, you know, yeah. like, like, well. I mean, another another thing to think about is just take a character and put them in a dilemma, you know, yeah. give, them, give them a choice, give them a choice where where there's a no win situation or 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 maybe you know there's a choice between the bad and the worse or so you know or or, or whatever. But um, that's the amazing thing about Kelly Link, and that's why I like I think Kelly Link and Jeff Ford stories blew me away is because they're they're not a they're not about they don't have that mythological structure. I call it mythological like. Um, the hero's journey. Kind yeah, of. they don't have they don't have that hero's journey. Sometimes they feel like it, but they don't. Um, and maybe sometimes I call it the literary structure. But they don't. They're such one of a kinds that they don't. <laughs> they don't have characters facing a choice and that that normal that normal arc, you know. So like their their stories, you still have the feeling those same feelings, um, even feelings of satisfaction. But um, they do amazing things. Like one I, one of these things. Uh, I call it the Kelly Link ending, like where she tried to teach some of her students, like, yeah, how do you have a stopping point in the story where it feels like you've hit the brakes, but that feeling that you're still you're still right, going, you're still, there's still momentum. And it's like, well, how do, and, and Jeff, uh, especially in Big Dark Hole, like I just think it's masterful when you can just like get a physical reaction from a reader. And Jeff and Kelly, um, Jeff and Kelly managed to do that. How? How they do it? I mean, right? You just take a character and follow it. Right, just follow them. From. What it's are you simple. talking about? That's all. Just write it and just just uh, follow the character until it's. But you know, um, and I'm not making fun of them because what I think what they do is 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 simply I'm magic. Afraid. And, I'm uh, afraid to make fun of Jeff Ford, man. He'll he'll find me. <laughs> he'll find where I live, and it will not be pretty. Yeah. <laughs> um. So we've talked a lot about about Jeff Ford. We've talked. Um, We've talked about Kelly Link. We, we've got uh, a couple of our of our influences on there. Let's um, shall we? I know there are a lot of writers we want to talk about, but before we get to 
some of the writers who are writing today. Do you want to do you want to talk a little bit about Lucia Shepard? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We were. Um, we've talked about him. I, I feel like like it's like a sort of ongoing thread that we pick up every now and again when when we talk. You know, mm. and and. Um, well, what a joy it is to talk about Lucia Shepard. I mean, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> I I remember, um, like I remember when I was a kid, um, when when Lucius in the eighties kind of broke big with things like Life During Wartime, and and he was in. It seemed like he was in every issue of uh, Isaac Asimov's science fiction magazine. You know, like I I knew his name. I knew, and I remember all sorts of people talking about uh, Life During Wartime and saying mm. this was like sort of early masterpiece and, and so on. But I, I kind of, although I, I, I certainly kept in, like I knew Lucius's name, but it wasn't again until that couch experience with my son where, where um, I started reading Lucius in, in a serious kind of way. And, and it was in part because the magazine of fantasy and science fiction had done a special Lucius Shepard issue. Uh. And they, published, uh, they published this novella by Lucius called eternity and afterward. And, oh, yeah. um, I just sat down and and you know over the course of probably a couple of naps you know read the story and I was just like holy cow this is you know this is just titanic work and and so then I started searching out everything of Lucius's that I could find and just and just consuming his stuff because you know at, at the level of of sort of pro style here was this great great writer who was not writing you know so much of I, I feel anyway that that so much of American literature especially skews towards the sort of Hemingway kind of stripped down kind of of, uh, of thing. And and that's, you know, science fiction as well, right? You know, uh, Asimov and, and all that. And and this is, of course, ignoring people like Delaney and Zelazny and, and so on. But um, so anyway, so so reading Lucius is this this lush, beautiful prose, which which went very deeply and directly into its character psyches was was just such a, a, a it was wasn't exactly, maybe it was a revelation. I mean, I had read a lot of stuff like that, but a lot of it was like, you know, a hundred years old, you know, or, or whatever. So it was like Faulkner or Henry James or, or whatever, these writers that I loved. But I suppose part of me was like, oh man, can you do this anymore? And then you read Lucius and it's like, oh man, you can absolutely do this and, and with a vengeance. And um, yeah, I, I was supposed to uh, read with them at the KGB. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah, and um, I was incredibly, I was like terrified, you know, because of course, this is the point when Nightshade books, the old Nightshade books, when they were an independent press, had their own, they, they had their own message board. And uh, Lucius was on there, pride, his little, whatever, you know, kingdom in there. And man, he did not suffer fools lightly. And and I was no, just he like, did not. <laughs> I, I was just like, you know, you would see them on there, like talking about all this, what to me was actually would probably still be kind of esoteric film and music, you know, and like, I'm the kind of person who would, who would go on there and would be like, how do you guys feel about REO Speedwagon, you know? And Lucius would just smite me, you know? <laughs> so, right, exactly. He would be like, get off the boat. And I, but we're in the middle of the North Atlantic, sir. And he'd be like, off the boat. So, um, <laughs> so, um, so I, was I was going to the World Fantasy Convention in 2003 when it was in Washington, D.C. And Lucius oh, was Oh, I was there. I was there. No way. Okay. So, so my wife said to me, she was like, okay, look, Lucius is going to be there. Buy him a drink. She was like, you know, find him at that, like, like just find him and, and, and buy him a drink and just kind of get to know him a little bit, you know? And, and I was like, oh, honey, that's genius, as most of my wife's ideas are. And so um, I found he was at the bar and I, I went up and I sat next to him. I was like, hey, man, you know, I'm supposed to be reading with you and, and you know, can I buy you a drink? And he was like, sure, martini. <laughs> and I was like, I don't remember. This is $2,003, but it was like $11 or something. And I was like, yeah. golly, you know, but um, <laughs> there, there goes that. Double. Right. There goes that, that, you know, the budget for the book room. But I was like, it's worth it. But then, you know, we had this really, um, I don't know, kind of intense conversation, you know, where, where he talked to me about, um, about uh, his, his upbringing and being this kind of angry kid and, and how uh, football and boxing had been his, his you know, it really helped him a lot. Um, and he, he talked, he had uh, just published uh, a, an introduction to a collection of Avram Davidson's Lime Killer stories. And he read part, he was like, listen to this, you know, and, and, like he kind of couldn't help himself, you know, once you kind of got him going, he really, he wanted to talk to you a lot, you know? And, um, and yeah, I saw him, um, 
I saw him a couple of times over the years after that um, and, and sort of communicated with him a little bit online, but I always found him this, just this kind of towering and intimidating figure. And, and yet the last time I saw him, which was probably at, at ReaderCon when he was the guest of honor, he was very um, almost sort of sweet and gentle. Uh, um, and, and I, and I kind of looking back on it, like, I think, I think he liked me at that point, you know, like, I think I'd sort of broken through or, or, or whatever, you know, and, and, um, yeah, I, I mean, he just to the end of his life, you know, and, and, um, he, he was just continuing to produce great work. He had entered this great, you know, we had this early stage, um, when he kind of burst on the scene with uh, with the stories in Asimov's and the Jaguar Hunter and, and Life During Wartime and Green Eyes. Um, and then he took um, he took a while off. Yeah. Yeah. He took a while off to uh, to go to work in Hollywood. Um, and then um, that last I, I don't know how long it was, maybe maybe 10 year period. He had this sort of great like late flowering of work and um, yeah, him 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 dying was was just a, a catastrophe. Um, it it was. I mean, you know, on the one hand, you want to say, well, the work remains, and that's true. The work does remain, and there's a lot of great work, and and much of it, um, not all of it, but much of it, you can find, you know, in, in reasonably affordable editions. Like like there, there's a, a a decent paperback of the Jaguar Hunter, and of um, there's a collection of of those later stories called Eternity and Afterwards, but. I'm sure there were still things that that um, have not been, you know, collected or or whatever. But yeah, a great writer of of novellas, basically. I think he he um, he wrote um, he wrote a late novel called The Handbook of American Prayer. That's a, yeah. a terrific, terrific book. Um, and um, I'm not sure if it's still in print. You could probably find it, you know, used for not. Yeah, they're all they're all readily available. I I one of, one of my hobbies is just yeah, just just. Just seeing seeing Lucia Shepherd books and just rescuing them and, yeah, and yeah, yeah. giving them to people, or I love buying like if I'm if I'm grooving on a particular story, I love buying its original appearance in Asimov's or fantasy and science fiction, and um, yeah, that and was buying it, and buying it for someone. Um, yeah. I I I was a real late bloomer when it came to knowing genre, or or I'm, I'm horribly underread. But one of the amazing things that happened to me as a teenager, um, um, you know, I, I, I was fortunate enough that my parents gave me some Stephen King books that was like, oh, wow, okay, let me go to the library and look for more. And one day, and the same day in the library, it's not this book, but the Arkham's copy of Lucius is the Jaguar Hunter was, I think, shelved side by side next to Tanith Lee's Dreams of Dark and Light. So one day I brought both of those books home. Yeah, that's a, that's a transformational moment right it there. Was a, it was a transformational moment that keeps on happening. I mean, those two books and, like, just two stories from there, like the Jaguar Hunter, right, like that – I didn't have words for what was happening to me. And right, I mean, right now, you know, all these decades later, okay, I can talk about structure and genre and this and that. But, yeah, just that story blew me away. I didn't know – I didn't know what it was doing. I didn't know what rules it was breaking. I didn't know how great it was for its time in the context. I just knew like, wow, this is the shit I want to read. You know, like this shit, that shit, it just, that's why I show up for writing that, that kind of prose, that kind of story that takes me somewhere, that kind of language, that kind of emotion, the, yeah. like, like the, the emotion the Jaguar Hunter is hands down. I don't. I don't even have to blink by saying, it is hands down, um, hands down my favorite short story. H hands down my favorite story. I mean, it's just so. It, it does everything for me. Um, and now you could fast forward. You could fast forward in years later, and, and okay, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm talking with you, or I'm, I'm talking with writers, and you could say, wow, what amazing kind of things what an amazing place in history it also has. Like when I was reading it off the shelf, I wasn't reading it because, Oh wow. Okay. This is, um, there isn't, there wasn't that much um, genre set in Latin America. There wasn't that much genre with Latin American protagonists. I wasn't even thinking that. I'm just thinking like, this is a cool, what a cool character, the repentant, the repentant uh, big cat hunter, you know, just trying to make, uh, uh, trying to make a living being squeezed out of his, his, 
his hometown there. Um, yeah, I think he so, was, he was, was, he was yeah. really fascinated by self-destructive characters, by self-sabotaging characters. He was really, 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 really interested in, in those kinds of, uh, in those kinds of characters. Yeah, true. He, is that, is that the DVD or is? Uh, that, this is, this is the hardcover book or the book. Uh, I think the, D, I think it came with the DVD. I held it up because, um, you said the Lucia Shepherd character. The, the, yeah. what, what did you say to self? You know, I was as as when you were going to talk about Lucia Shepherd, I was like saying like, okay, what? How do you tell someone about Lucia Shepherd? And while not all of his stories have this format, there is a Lucia Shepherd story. <laughs> we talk about the Kelly Link story. We talk yeah, about yeah, the yeah. Jeff Ford story. If I had to, if you had to boil Lucia Shepherd, like what's Lu what's what does Lucius do, and what does he do best? Okay, he has that Lucia Shepherd character. Who's a disaffected, disgruntled, anti kind of nor like anti hero? Probably yeah. has something to do with rock and roll or drugs, right? He's he's yeah. that guy, right? And then um, that guy always, most of the time, he finds he he's in, or he finds his way to Central America, or 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 something to do with the band, right? So you have that character, you have Central America, and then you have. Like in in the the hard boiled uh, private dick story, you then you have a beautiful and mysterious woman. Okay, so you have that. You have the Lucius character. You have um, you have Central America. You have this beautiful and mysterious woman, and then shit gets weird. You know, and most of the time it probably has something to do with with that woman. Without without amazingly without being misogynistic or or patriarchal, you know. I mean, it's still very, it's very organic, and um, you, you you have this these characters going going into um, these dark these dark mysteries and weird situations that are very setting heavy. Yet, um, like you said, they they um, they're integral to the character. Right? They're these explorations of emotion. They're exploration. Um, of you know, in addition to the 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 weirdness, it's um it's also like traveling into the dark heart of um of these antiheroes. And I, I pulled Trujillo, Trujillo because um yeah, that's just that's just that's this is the that's the distinct boiled down version of the Lucia Shepherd story. Like it's it's all it's it's all in there. Um, and and what a joy. Just just so different. Just so different on his on his own ground, and um, yeah, if you have to say who's who's a writer, um, yeah, may he rest in peace and deserving of of deserving of wider recognition. And when I say deserving, it's just like not just because I love it or it made a difference to me. It's like I think people I think people would love it. I think people if they pick it up would be like, yeah. and people and most of the people who do pick up a Lucia Shepard story for the first time, they're like. Oh wow! I had no idea. You know, like I had no idea it's actually good. Right. You know, so it's like I thought that was just like you're. Uh, I'm humoring you. <laughs> was just right, weird, right, right. That's that weird, that weird shit. But man, that guy can write. No one can write like him. Yeah, no and, and like him. It's weird because once in a while he would insert a villain in his stories. Quite often, it's just the the the, the protagonist struggling against you know. A kind of manifested supernatural, right? But that may that seems to have some weird connection to him, right? But then every now and again he would write um he has a short vampire novel called The Golden, mm -hmm. um, which is set inside the sort of castle of the vampires, um, where this guy who's a newly minted vampire has to figure out this who's committed this particular crime. And as part of the novel, he he sort of meets the king of the vampires, who is like just this this force of, of sort of, of of horror and decadence, this almost like this sort of black hole. Like a lot of Lucius's, I think when he deals with villains, his villains tend to be almost like these, these just these black holes that just draw everything into themselves. And their, you know, their own kind of vanitism, vanity, excuse me, and egotism and, and decadence and corruption, it's all just kind of collapsed into, into this, this thing, this singularity, that just draws everything into towards itself. Um, yeah, it, it uh, uh, Lucius was great. You know, he was great for these stories. Um, and I, I remember, you know, many years, I, I mean, I, I guess many years after his death, actually, you know, somebody said to me, you know, 
a lot of those things either they didn't happen or they didn't happen the way Lucius told them or you know and and um but man I I you know I never knew Lucius I never knew Lucius I I've, I've I've had the opportunity of just coincidentally meeting his friends after the fact and like man the, if half the shit that I hear was true man holy shit <laughs> yeah he would just and you know you could never tell like like because I mean, like, okay, for example, I remember him telling this story about uh, he's saying, "Oh yeah, you know," because he did play in several bands. He sang in several bands and and uh, in the Pacific Northwest. And and he talked about being. I was in this bar one time, and and you know, the the bar had this. It was some out in the middle of nowhere, but the owner had this big display case, and it had a chimpanzee in it. You know, and the chimpanzee just hung out there, and he had like a tire and. I don't know, some greenery, and he seemed to be okay. And One day we let him play bass, and here's the tape, Lang. And <laughs> oh, no, it gets, it gets better. So he was like, so this guy I knew comes in. He's out, you know, riding his motorcycle, and he comes in, and, and he, he, he ties one on, and he decides he wants to fight the chimpanzee, and the owner's like, don't fight the chimpanzee. No. He, he goes in to, like, throw down with the chimpanzee, and the chimpanzee just picks him up and throws him out. <laughs> so. I'm laughing, but the guy gets really mad and he goes out and he puts on his motorcycle helmet so he won't get hurt. And then he goes back in and the chimpanzee just pulls off the helmet and beats him up with his own helmet and throws him out. And then finally the guy's like, okay, peace, peace, because the monkey's kind of agitated. So he brings him a beer and they both have a beer and they bond, you know? Brought me a beer in the first place, silly human. Right. We and the funny been... thing is, like, I tell that story, and I'm like, that has to be a made-up story. But then it's also so outrageous that you think that has to be a true story, you know? Yeah. And, and either way, it's a good story. It's a funny story, you know? But that's the kind of stuff that Lucius would just, like... And some some of the things were a lot darker, don't get me wrong. Some yeah. of the stories he would tell were a lot a lot grimmer. I, but... I, feel, like, I feel like that's in his work, like, um, I'm thinking of... Uh... Stars seen through stone from fantasy and science fiction. One of his novellas was very. Yeah. I feel like you were. I feel like that. You. Those are stories about that guy or that that iteration of of Lucius. Well, and, and that one in particular, you know, it's it's about these people who are living in this place that's that's visited by these um, ethereal creatures, and and when these things show up, they produce intense creativity in the people who are living there. And then when they leave, you're kind of bereft in a in a way. You you know, and and I I wondered. I have to admit, like like I wonder now if it was in some way like Lucius thinking about maybe his own spells of creativity. And and at times you feel more creative, at times you feel less. You know, and that's that. that like I said, that's speculation on my part. But of what you think that was just Lucius is um, just making a, a, a metaphor for things he experienced. Yeah, or, or or elaborating on a on a metaphor, you know, just uh, just pushing. I mean, I mean, who knows, right? Yeah, well, I never. Well, we could probably ask. I, I never had the opportunity to know him other than as a fan to get his autograph. But um, um, yeah, the great Lucius Shepard. Glad, glad to um, glad for the always. I'll, I'll always, I'll always talk about Lucius Shepard. I'll never not talk about Lucius Shepard. Um, yeah. John, do you want to tell us? Um, do you want to tell us about? Um, I'll give you the solo screen for a minute or two, and um, and then I'll join you. Do you want to start telling us about um, some of your best of the year? Some things that are on your radar? Maybe some some writers that you think we should be having a look at? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, um, I'll joining, I'm going to give you solo screen. I'm going to be back in just a sec. All right, everybody, he's gone again. Let's get crazy. Um, so, <laughs> you know, dance party. Um, so um, um, yeah, I've I've um, I haven't really uh, been doing the amount of reviewing that I had been doing for for Locust Magazine in years gone by, but I've I've tried, uh, and this is because of my day job. But but in the last couple of years, I, I still try to do my my uh, end of year summary. Um, and um, and in addition to that, um, after I had finished my end of year summary, which which appeared um, in the February issue of Locus, and which um, which is also I, I put it up on my my blog as well, um, I read a couple of books after the the summary was done that um, 
well, you know how it is. You, you always miss something, right? And and in this case, though, I, I missed a book called Plain Bad Heroines by Emily Danforth and a book called It Will Just Be Us by uh, by Joe Kaplan, uh, which are just knock, knock it out of the park uh, successes. Um, uh, Plain Bad Heroines, which Paul Tremblay was telling me about, he was he gave a blurb to the book and he said, you got to, when this book comes out, you've got to get this book. And um, it's this great big doorstopper of a novel. Um, one of the things I said, I, I put a little write up about both of these on my blog earlier today. And one of the things I said about Plain Bad Heroines is, you know, when I think of like, oh, big horror novel, right? I think of like 80s style, you know, sort of doorstopper. Um, uh, a large cast of characters, the town's in jeopardy, there's an ancient supernatural evil, you know. Um, this is written in, in a way that's much more sort of postmodern and playful. The narrative voice, um, to, to me, was much more engaging and had much more in common um, with, uh, with I don't know, you know, the, the kinds of things I think about with David Foster Wallace and, and such. Um, and... Um, and yeah, it's just an utterly immersive experience. It's the it's the kind of book. I mean, it moves back and forth between between past and present. Um, it has footnotes. Um, there's a lot of bees in it. So if bees bother you, you know, um, and it uh, it has this ending that I'm still I'm still kind of mulling over. And then Joe Kaplan's "It Will Just Be Us" um, it, it is in comparison a slimmer novel, but um, man, it's about this this haunted house that. Um, is is unlike any haunted house I've run into before. In that, um, it's it's almost uh, it, it's full of ghosts, and it's full of of ghost memories. I guess you would say, the um, the the narrator and her her mother and her her sister, um, who've grown up in this house, um, who, who've lived in this house, are used to these things. Oh, there's uh, you know there's this ancestor, or or in fact there's me when I was twelve years old. Um, and um, it's it's a beautifully written book. The the prose is is um, the kind of prose that's that's good enough that every now and again you're like, dang, this is this is really good prose. Um, and it's also extremely unsettling in places. One of those books where where again you think, why am I reading this right before bed? Why who thought this was a good idea? Um, and which which just in a lot of novels, you know, when you you read a lot of horror novels. Or, 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 you know, I, I don't know, weird novels, whatever you want to call them. You, you think to yourself quite often, at least I do, oh, man, like almost how are they going to get out of the situation they've set up? You know, like, like they seem to be heading to this really horrifying ending. How are they going to cheat? <laughs> how are they going to or what clever way are they going to find to get out of this? And, and Joe Kaplan does not do that. She goes right for the throw and, and, and past that. It, it has this just this terrific ending. I was so impressed um, with the, the kind of integrity of the, of the novel um, and, and of her writing. So um, I, I would say just these are books that, um, that have both come out. Um, I want to say they, they might have both come out this past October. Um, and, um, you know, there are a lot of great things, um, that, that, that came out previously, but, but I feel like these two things, I feel like they sort of slipped under the, the radar for me. And, and, um, I really, I, I feel like I can't say enough good things about them right, uh, right now. Yeah. I didn't read that first book you mentioned, but I, I did, um, uh, I did read Joe Kaplan's book, um, uh, either a beta version of it or, or in advance. And, um. Joe, Joe also writes as Joanna uh, Parapinski, and um, she's a must read for me. If I see her name, um, I, I just love, uh, I, I love her work. I love her work. Yeah, no, I, 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 I um, it, it was one of those things where I thought I got to go back and find these stories now because I have a lot of those different anthologies or years best or whatever. And, and I think a, a certain yeah. amount of it's online too. And I thought I really, I have to I have to catch up on this writer because this is you're, 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 you'll be in for a treat. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll hold up um, some of these books. I'll hold up. You, you may have um, you may have seen some other stuff um, on our radar. Have you have you checked out Sarah Langan's latest yet? Good. Sarah good Lang day. There's another Langan. Lang what? You're what? long lost Langan. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, uh, something that's on my radar here, um, Good Neighbors is, is, is a great read. Um, fantastic book um, as well. I feel like I, I know I have my copy around here somewhere. Yeah, I'm, I'm, 
I'm reading it too, and and it's such it's so sharply done. You know the um, yeah uh, the prose is is so is so razor sharp, so fine, and and the observation is so so fine and so brilliant as well. Yeah, yeah, Sarah Lang and um, yeah, probably it probably isn't anything she can't do, and and that 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 book is just yeah just razor sharp um, observations and just doing something really, really interesting. And it's great. It's great to see that. Um, it's great to see Sarah back. It's great to see a novel from her. Um, people should yeah. check that out. Um, here's a book I, I just um, got a copy of uh, from Mike Thorne, Shelter of the Damned. I'm really uh, curious about this one. Yeah. 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 I, I had a chance to blow. What did, what did I say? I said something about it. Um, I think right, rather than reinvent, oh, I thought, um, Oh, I said, we all need a place of shelter. Mike Thorne asks us, what if your cherished sanctuary isn't what it seems? In their iconic Rush song, Subdivisions, Canadian rock band Rush, I think I think because Mike's Canadian, I quoted Rush, nice. the suburbs have no charms to soothe the restless dreams of youth. Thorne taps into the rage of suburban youth with this tale of high school friends, bullies, and parents who don't understand. And of course, there are monsters and murder. In shelter for the damned. The only question left is: Will you take the ride Mike Thorne has in store for us and take shelter there? Well, that was that was kind of a sales pitch, but yeah, this is um, uh, it's a weird fiction. It's definitely a a, a high school rage bullying mixed in with a real weird, weird fiction uh, speculative element there. And uh -huh. gorgeous cover, gorgeous cover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Go ahead. Rush, Rush has come to appeal to me a lot more as I've gotten older. So, <laughs> me too. I used to, yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't stand Rush, or I just I didn't understand. I didn't understand them when I was. Uh, yeah, it, it's right, right. Like, like I and I knew there were people I knew who were like Rush, man, and I was like, oh, come on. <laughs> and now I'm kind of like I'm not exactly like Rush, but I'm I'm kind of like Rush, you know? Yeah, I'm interested. There, they, there's a thing. There's a there's a thing when you're in the mood for their thing. It hits the spot. Um, the two bands that I totally didn't get, that I thought the world was crazy, that now I really get, are um, are um, Ronnie James Dio mm -hmm. and Iron Maiden. Like when I was a teenager, I'm just like, what the fuck? Who the hell? And like maybe you know, I came to metal and, and hard rock much much later in life. You know, I went from just like, what is that to like. Okay, I get it now. I get it now. Yeah, no, me too. I I really came because of my my younger son, who's a musician, and um, we um, there was I mean, I guess I liked some. I liked I liked some hard rock, but but the the, you know, I don't know. Um, it's funny, right? Because now Sabbath, Black Sabbath, doesn't really sound like um, um. Th they don't sound like heavy metal, you know, like like they they in in the same way that um. Slayer. They're so, yeah, they're yeah. so melodic. They're so they're yeah. so melodic that like I listen to it. It's something beautiful and melodic as like Gojira or some whatever Scandinavian uh, gothic death metal, whatever. Like it, it, you know, the, what was heavy decades ago is now like not like suddenly Judas Priest doesn't seem so heavy. It seems like sing, sing along, you know. And, no, exactly, and exactly. And I, I know I've become because of my son. I've become a. Um, very and you know the funny thing is that like I think to myself why didn't you like these when you were a kid and I think part of it was that I grew up like during the satanic panic in a very catholic household in a very catholic community I went to catholic school and so yeah we would have um you know the deacon coming in and telling us about all this music we had to watch out for and I think also the kids you know, I, I was not the most athletic and, and whatever of kids. So so the kids who kind of gave me a hard time all liked ACDC and Black Sabbath and that. So because of that, I just, I was like, well, that's what those guys like. But oh, now, okay. because of, uh, now because of my kid, you know, things like ACDC and, and Sabbath, old ACDC, the, the, the Bon Scott stuff. Yeah, yeah. This is amazing stuff, you know? Yeah. It had such feel. Such Old ACDC had such, uh, well, whatever like, else it had, it had, it had, it had like, uh, like blues, you know, like, like sort of like hard edged blues, you know? And, and yeah, with, with Sabbath, it's just this 
crazy, crazy stuff. And and so yeah, I went to my first Ozzy Osbourne concert with my son like three years ago, I think it was. You know, he was playing. Uh, was that Jones was, Beach Theater? The Jones Beach Theater. Yeah, right. uh, you probably drove uh, right by my house. I'm not so far away from. Oh well, it was it was the night there was a big storm, and we had gotten tickets, so we were at the very top of the amphitheater. But this big storm, like sort of whatever it was fall storm, had blown in. So um, for those who don't know, Jones Beach Theater, the theater is actually out over the water. And the people who have the great seats are are sitting kind of equal with the water. So if there's any kind of, let's say, a storm, the you water- You get sprayed. You get sprayed. <laughs> you know? so, so we're up at the top freezing to death. And I was like, but, but, but at least we're not like those guys. You know? Yeah. Oh, man. I've been up in those tops like, you know. The, those are really high seats, man. Those are like, you know, that that theater isn't what it used to be, man. Uh, um, well, and it became, I think, for me, it it it's. I became, um, you know, with with as as I hit fifty and 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 the territory beyond, like I, I became sort of worried about the, I don't know, sort of calcification of my own kind of brain and tastes and this sort of stuff, and and. So I, I suppose I was almost a little compulsive about, you know, my son was like, listen to this. And I was like, sure, new stuff, you know, and, and well, what, a all... what, a, what a joy it is. I mean, there's so many joys wrapped up in that sentence. I mean, yeah. just whatever's new to you. I, I find it so delightful to hear because when I, I see you on social media point, uh, posting about your son and the rock music, and I just jumped to a conclusion, I thought for sure that this was a gift that you were giving your son. I think we had talked to this. I thought for sure that you were turning him on to like the music that you love. And I guess just like a wonderful story does, like when you told me that now, like you, know, my, you were getting into it to bond with your son. Yeah. I was just like, wow, how, how amazing is it that your son's turning you on to this stuff and, and that you get to, to bond with your son over it. But that this is that this is new to you. You know, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, a lot of people will give uh, a lot of hipsters will give a shit like, oh, yeah, you're just an old white guy listening to Rush. I'm like, you know, you're gonna take joy. Like, hey, I listen, I listen to everything, but right. I'm gonna take joy. I'm gonna take joy, and I'm gonna take inspiration from where I find it. You know, um, and I'm glad. I'm glad we're talking about this because I know we had we had meant to ask to to steer into some of our non are non-literary influences, but I think we're, we're, we're knee deep into the music part of, yeah, no, of I, that I, discussion I, right now. You know, I, I mean, on the one hand, um, man, I, I can't remember if it was, um, Wynton, was it Wynton Marsalis, man, I, who used to do a radio show and it was, a, it was a, about jazz, and, but he, but he used to quote Duke Ellington saying like, if, if it sounds good, it is good. That like, that's like, like, you know, and, and that's a really powerful, uh, measuring stick, you know, and, and yeah. if, it, if it sounds good to you, um, that's great. You know, that's, that's fine. If, if, um, if rush works for you, so what, who cares, you yeah. know, like, yeah. it, it, and so, yeah, we've, uh, that, so, so I've, I've done a lot of like, um, new wave of British heavy metal with them. So we went to see Judas Priest and, uh, in concert at, uh, Oh, the Barclay Center, I think it was in Newark, um, which was an utterly, like, it was a trippy experience, man. It, oh, it, wow. Well, because we were, again, once again, we were kind of up in the rafters, you know, but but everybody there it was like, so first off, I was like, there were guys who were a lot older than me there. And I was like, <laughs> wow, this is kind because you kind of think you're going to a, like a, a rock show. It's going to, you're going to be the old man there. But I was like, I think I'm actually the median age here or possibly, <laughs> on the young side, you know? Yeah. Yeah. There were, um, there were all these young, younger guys, probably 30 something, I would say all there with their, what looked like their long suffering partners. And, um, they all just stood up. And they would like point to each other, you know, and then they would give these like howls, you know, and there was this one guy in front of us who looked kind of like Seth Rogen. Um, and every now and again, he would just shout, the gods are here. <laughs> and, <laughs> and like everybody else would be like, yeah. And I was like, this is wild. This is, yeah. You know, so I hate it when people like, you know, I mean, granted, uh, I don't relish the experience. Um, going back to concerts because COVID, like I'm still spooked yeah. out by people, but I, know, I, hear you. You know, I hated it at concerts when like, that's part of the joy of concert. I loved it when people went, went nuts in concerts, you know, I'm like, that's part, it's part of the electricity yeah. of just like, you know, I mean, not like being disgusting, but like, 
people no, no. freaking it, out and having an experience like that is no. like that's so that's so inspiring. That's so part of the um, that's so part of the live experience and just the the singing. Like if there's ever a part where like everyone's singing on something, you know, uh, that is like. Well, no, when when uh, when uh, when Judas Priest came on before they came on, they had the the stage of these big curtains on the stage, and um, and and you're like, when are they coming? When are they coming? You can hear them, you know, sound check and all this kind of stuff. Anyway, and and they played the beginning of of uh, of War Picks of uh, of Black Sabbath's War Picks, and everybody sang along at the top of their lungs, yeah. and the whole space is just like vibrating with. Um, with what was actually really this really joyous noise, you know, with with everybody just like here we are, man, and and they were funny. I think what was funny to me about them, and the same thing when I saw Ozzy actually, was they were both uh, both um, Rob Halford and Ozzy were so sweet. They kept saying, "We love you, thank you so much," so, you know, like like you really got the sense that they appreciated their fans. Um, they're still they're still standing after all the bullets a rock star. That's <laughs> absolutely <laughs> true. It's, 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 Especially it's, Ozzy, man. You know, like yeah. Ozzy's lived, he's lived quite a life. Like in some, I've, I've heard so many. Whenever you're feeling sad, you should just listen to an like listen to Howard Stern interview Ozzy or listen to an Ozzy interview. It's just there's yeah, just yeah. so much bizarroness and joy. Like Ozzy's like. Howard, who is a great interviewer, is like trying to ask Ozzy, and Ozzy's on. He's not trying to stifle him. He's like, Howard, I have no memory making that album. I don't remember any of those years. Right. <laughs> he's just like, you know, I don't remember it. I don't even. Remember. He's like, Howard knew all the history. He's like, you stayed in this hotel. You do. He's right, like, right. okay. <laughs> he's like, I told. I've I've been told that that is true. Right. Right. My lawyers have advised me not to answer this line of inquiry. Uh, or actually, probably you know, his wife. Like uh, more interesting, or just as interesting as Ozzy is just uh, his wife Sharon Osbourne. Who, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Ozzy. Yeah, not not even for the comedic, just the the behind the scenes mastermind of many many mm -hmm. a rock career. You know. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. And and I think you know uh, that's the what, what's fascinating to me is, um, man, at the time. Um, uh, again, th this is the eighties I'm talking about here, you know, like Ozzy or twisted sister, and like, they seemed so dangerous, you know? And now I look at them from 40 years later and, and they just, they do, they seem like performers. They, they seem like, like, yeah. how, how did we ever, how did we, how did anybody ever think that, that, that Sabbath or, or, or any of them? Um, were these, you know, satanic masterminds or, or whatever, you know, I, I mean, look, well, at there was no, there was no internet. There was no, um, media was much more focused. So like what you put on an album and an album jacket, you know, and the back of a denim jacket was much, much more yeah. of the message, you know, as or this 20, 24 hour news. Um, yeah. And it was, it don't get me wrong. I mean, it was deliberately sort of Gothic and, and, you know, d deliberately sort of over the top, but but you know, I just I listen to um, you know Ozzy comes on the radio every now and again, and I'm like, man, listen to those synthesizers, you know, like like they're yeah. like it's oh it's god, so he did a song with uh, was it Post Nup? Was it Post Malone? He just like you know oh, my I, four, I, I don't my know, four, like you said, like I I listen to what my 14 year old nephew listens to, and um, yeah, yeah, and somehow that came like that came up, and I was like, he's like, yeah, this is the guy that bites bats heads. I'm like, ah. Oh, Oh my God, that is that is Ozzy. It's like you know Ozzy's voice, like totally auto tuned and synth pitch, singing with like post no, no. singing do it. He's like, yeah, that guy's a great voice. I'm like, wow, that's just uh... yeah. He's an even better voice when you don't auto tune it. Yeah, I, I, I yeah, uh... but, yo, I mean, it's like you said, uh, not for me, but no, yeah, no, no, fair it, enough, fair enough. That's... If it, you know, um, there's so much stuff that's not for me, but like if it brings genuine joy to people, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. down for it. But I'm also down for it. Because it makes it easier for an uncle to be a gateway drug, you know. I'm like, hey, right, right. look up, look, look up this. There, there's yeah, a little bit of this. Cool. Here's the truth behind the biting, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, there's so much, you know. There's uh, there's so much stuff coming out of Australia right now. My 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 son is a huge fan. King King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard, right? Who were this insane yeah, okay. Australian band um, who do these like every. 
every couple of albums, they just reinvent themselves. So they just did an album um, a couple of years ago uh, called Inf Infest the Rat's Nest, I think it is, which is like a kind of speed metal album, but but with this big science fiction theme in the best metal sense, you know, where it's all wow. talking about, about going to other planets and um, but then they'll do a psychedelia album or they'll do a, an album that, that's kind of like um, kind of jazzy. Um, and there's um, there's a group called Stonefield, which is also kind of a psychedelic group. Um, and that's four sisters um, who uh, who play together um, and a fantastic punk group uh, called Amel and the Sniffers, who are just um, pure punk I, I mean there's, there's a lot of really exciting stuff like all over the place i just discovered this mongolian band called the who uh okay, yeah you yeah you know they they um they do like sort of kind of metal with traditional mongolian instruments and and uh, that's, the, that's the beauty look there may there may be some downsides to globalization and homogenizations but one of the upsides is the way that how music music can float proliferate in a way that it didn't when we were kids you know like there's no way we would have gotten no absolutely music, now absolutely. it's like um uh yeah you can plug in you can go down rabbit holes you can plug in and i think i think it's good for music um it's definitely good for us listeners you know i mean it's it's come yeah we're, we're so far it's we've come so far into this the future like the, my younger self is so far in the future i'm like what do you mean no one has a CD player? You know, like, wait right, a minute, right. tapes are back now? Okay, <laughs> vinyl, I never left vinyl, but, like, you know, right. it's like, it's it's such a future. Like, wait, my Which iPod, I, no one uses iPods anymore? I Wait, I just got, I just made my first playlist. How can this be? You know, like. Right. Well, it, it's funny, right, because on the one hand, like, like I'm thinking about Lucius, right? To take it back to Lucius, and 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 like I'm like there are these great, it's this great Australian punk band, and like I feel like Lucius is smiling down, yes, you know, because Lucius was always into that. But 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 you know what you said about about Lucius writing about Central America. Lucius was also reading a lot of writers from Central America. I don't know if he read them in Spanish or in translation, but I I think that part of what makes his his fiction so great, and this is true of Ford too, is and and. Most of the the people we're talking, really all the people we're talking about, is is the way that they they, I don't know if if, if you like if they they blend a lot of the material of the of the American fantastic fantastica whatever that tradition with all kinds of other things and in Lucius's case I, I think he had read um, a lot of Central and South American literature and so he was he was kind of mixing that together with the stuff that he was getting. Um, in a lot of cases, out of like the like Avram Davidson and people out of the American science fiction tradition and and fantasy tradition. Wow! Yeah, I would have loved. I would have loved to have. Um, I would have loved to have asked to been able a chance to ask him about his process or how it worked. I mean, um, yeah, I have. Yeah. It, it's it was one of the fascinating things, and I've always meant to. Okay, so he announced at a certain point that he was going to publish this short novel called uh, Viator. Um, and yeah, it was a, yeah. About a ship that had run aground, like 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 a ground aground, like it had gone like a hundred yards into the forest, and this guy is on it, and blah blah blah. And he published the novel, and it's this kind of crazy trippy short novel. Then he re he edited it. He he added like twenty thousand words to it and published a new version. And he said, um, uh, he said that that he realized while he was writing it that he felt really really bad physically and uh emotionally and when all was said and done he just sort of got the book done and he got it into the the publisher but it wasn't what he wanted it to be and afterwards he realized he'd been suffering from depression and mm. and, and so he he went back and he kind of redid the the book and i've always meant i have the the revised edition i've just never gotten around to it but oh, i wonder talking. which edition i have hmm well, the the Nightshade one has a which was who published it originally has like like a, a um, maybe John Picaccio uh, did the uh, uh, did the cover and it's just a, a ship. Um, the the PS Publishing did Viator Plus, which which had the revised one. Oh, I have the plus. I have the plus. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, John, what about your creative process? I, I hate I hate to say the word. Um, there's the there's the planner and then there's the the pantser both both which make me a little itchy, but um, 
are you a planner? Are you a pantser? Are you some combination of both? Um, I, I think at this point, I think I've always been um, a, a pantser. But uh, as you say, right, I, I mean, that's not, um, it's it's inadequate, you know, because I I find that I have to have like a kind of voice, like like I have to have a first line that kind of, and, and it gives me the voice of the story and then I start going. But I usually have a sense of where the story's headed. And there does come a certain point for most stories where I know, at least I think I know what, what the end of the story is going to be. And then I write towards that. So I don't really have an outline necessarily, but in the margin, I'll make notes. I'll be like, yeah. oh, yeah, you know, what about you? You have a plan. You have a plan at some point, but it's not, it's not a. It's not an outline. It's not a formal yeah. outline. What about, it's what about you? Pantser or, or planner? Um, different, different at different stages of the process. I mean, um, when I'm, when I'm writing, when I get down to the point where I'm sitting down and saying, I am making a first draft, at that point, I am an obsessive planner. If I don't have it all written out, I want to be able to tell you the story before, before I don't want to be, I don't, for my process, I don't ever want to be making decisions on the page. Mm -hmm. um, at least the big decisions. That being said, you know the cliche of like okay the story talks to you there's so much that there's so much that changes on the fly but um by the time i'm making what okay i am making a short story i want to be at the point of where i'm transcribing it where i can tell you that story right that's opposite of like inspiration i'm the exact opposite when it comes to inspiration when i'm not writing i'm just always i'm always being inspired and I'm always looking through the lens of like, right, things will come to me from a dream or yeah. Or that song or something, the, 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 the inspiration part of what like, Oh yeah. Like when we, you know, we were talking that that guy would make a cool story, you know, maybe in that way, I'm like a pantser in terms of like, or I'm not, um, I'll never, I'll never say no to an idea or I'll never say no to inspiration. But nope. once I come down and I take those inspirations, so I have folders and folders of notes and napkins and things but I'll go through a sort of a process where all the, th all the things that I've never said no to, I'll make a decision and say, okay, this is the best, or this, this is, this is now ready to go through the uh, meat grinder of craft. And then I become, I become an obsessive planner. Yeah, no. And, and I think that, you know, this is something I, I feel like I've, I've been um, repeating myself about, but I, I feel it's so important over the last several years. Um, and it, it's an idea that I get, um, um, I get from um, a book by Kate Wilhelm called Storyteller. That, oh yeah, I have that book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that, that that Kelly and and Gavin, uh, a small beer press, published, and and yeah, she talks about your imagination. She compares it to a little dog, um, and and she's like, you know, if your little dog brings you like a toy to play with, and every time it brings you a toy to play with, you're like, go on, get out of here, I'm too busy, um, or no, I don't want, I don't want to play with you there comes a certain point where the dog stops because the dog is just like, eh, you know, it doesn't pay off. And, and I, she compared the imagination to this and she said, you know, your imagination brings you ideas and, um, and, and what, what you know, a lot of what I, I feel like a lot of what I did when I was a young writer was like, no, no, I could never write that. No, that's terrible. No. And, and then I would be like, why don't I have anything to write? You know? And, and my imagination was like, well, I brought you some ideas, but you know, and so one of the things, yeah, that I've tried to cultivate is, is a kind of openness to just, um, who knows, who knows what you could, what you could do, who knows where, you know, where, where, how a story could be generated. It's, it's, um, and, and just, it's not always going to work, you know, but, but, um, um, I, I do, I enjoy, you know, uh, like you, <laughs> You said earlier, I don't get invited to any anthologies, right? <laughs> um, shame on you, editors. But um, <laughs> but at the same time, right? Like like there have been there have been a number of anthologies that I wasn't invited to, but I was like, and, and I was like, oh man, I wish I had been invited to that Alice in Wonderland anthology because I think I could have written a cool story for that. And then years later, I was invited to another like an open call, and I was like, you know what? I've got an idea for an Alice in Wonderland story. So um, 
in in the same way, there was a, a many well, probably ten years ago now. There was an Oz anthology. I can't remember what it was called, exactly Oz reimagined or something. But again, I thought, oh man, I I I wish I was invited to that. Um, at some point, I'll write that Oz story. You know, so I think that's something else. Like. I think for young writers, actually not even all writers, you know, you don't get invited to something. You're like, I'll get you, you know, mm -hmm. but hold on to the idea. If it's an idea that really speaks to you, hold on to that. And it will, it will, you'll find a way to use it. You know, I, I think it's interesting the way, the way things, um, how you said that. Yeah. If you, your imagination's like a dog and if you don't, it'll do funny things to you if you don't use it. Like, uh, I, it got to the point where I guess it's like a meme, one of those one of those memes where everything's a meme. You know, you're working on your work in progress. It got to the point where I would just cheat on my work in progress by, all right, I'll cheat on my work in progress by, I'll go down, the, I'll, I'll write one of those stories my imagination gave to me. Right. Where you know, um, I'm not a researcher. Um, I have I have all these these plans or ideas for books or stories that I'm quote unquote researching, but um, or or just things I'm long term obsessed with and. Um, I, for years, I've been like, someday I'm gonna write my surfing story. I'm gonna write my surfing story. I'm gonna write, and I guess that was the one that would that would that would just um, that I just kept pushing down because like when Underworld Dreams came out, people were like, oh, it's this is water themed book, and you did so good with the with the surfing and the one. I'm like, wow, I guess I I I guess I was writing that anyway. You know the things yeah. that you're not writing like. Yeah, like suddenly I felt like, oh, I'll just set this story here, or all right, this guy will be making a surfboard for a living, and suddenly, suddenly I have a you know a theme of like, wow, why are all these things popping up that um, you couldn't have done it if it was intentional, right? Like, oh, okay, yeah, I guess yeah. that was I was trying to stuff it down for when I felt I felt someday was here, but it would just keep some of these things keep reappearing in um, in your stories. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I, yeah. It's the whole trust your obsession thing, you know, but but it's also I, I think one of the other things I've, I'm, I'm coming around to, like, I feel the same. I have, I have certain stories where I'm like, oh, haven't done the research to write that one. I don't know if I'm ready to write that one. And, and increasingly there I'm like, you know what? Write it because life is short um, and just do the you, you, you will do the research, write the story and, you know, do the research. You, you'll do it along the way or whatever. But. But, you know, kind of while you've got the idea, do something with the idea. And, you know, maybe maybe you'll you won't finish it. I mean, that's certainly I've, I have a few stories that are unfinished. Like, OK, I'll get back to those. But at least they're in some kind of form to, to start with. Um, yeah, some any um, I have some books before we before it gets too late in the in the show that I, I just want to put up there. Um, Absolutely, uh, a great, a great, a great book from last year, "The Invention of Ghosts" by Gwendolyn Kai. Uh, she's terrific. Oh, yeah, she's really great. This this one in particular uh, is, is a great one. Um, I think you have a story in here which I haven't gotten to yet, but then Ina Ina Afris is a yes. writer to watch. She's uh, she is terrific. She is just she is just like nothing else. Yeah, she's yeah, great. She her. She's only had a couple of stories. Um, man, are they great. Man, is she great. Uh, Ina Ephrus, must buy, must buy. Really, yeah. that's someone, that's someone, um, one of my few must, must buy writers. And um, yeah, let's, let's hear it for weird, for weird horror. Um, I'm looking forward to diving into this and hope that that book does really well. Um, Douglas Wynn. Uh, the the wind the wind in my heart a beautiful we we're talking we were talking about noir and this is a oh, yeah. this is a uh, a supernatural noir book it's it's hard boiled it's set in New York um, a real wonderful Tibetan element that you don't see very much does deals with Tibetan lore Tibetan uh, supernatural aspects and. Um, Kind of reminded me favorably it had that angel heart vibe going on. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's a mystery, there's a hard boiled, there's a supernatural. So, um, yeah, that's just some some good stuff that's been been on my radar. Any any other good things on your radar, John? Oh, so many. You know, like I, I look around at all these books that I've ordered. You know, <laughs> it's like when am I yeah. gonna? I've started. Um, I've started reading this one. 
um, Stephen Graham Jones's uh, forthcoming "My Heart Is a Chainsaw." Um, uh, how am I doing? Did that yeah. Um, and um, you know, Stephen's just um, man. Uh, he's so good. Um, and um, the only good Indians, I, I think, is is a contemporary classic. I mean, that just bowled me over. I really love Mongrels too, and I I, I think Mongrels is probably a contemporary classic too. They're very different books. Um, um, also, um, I got a um, an advanced reading copy of um, Gemma Files' new collection um, mm -hmm. in this endlessness our end, and and Gemma is um, Gemma is a force of nature, man. I, I mean, she has just um, you know, it's interesting, right? Because in the late '90s, she published um, a couple of collections of stories: uh, "Kissing Carrie" and "The Worm in Every Tongue." She won uh, the International Horror Guild Award, and then for a few years, you know, she was she was having um, having her son, and um, she was teaching, and and um, and it. I think it took her. She, she wrote a lot of fan fiction. She wrote, um, uh, and that fan fiction ultimately became. Um, the Hexlinger trilogy, the novels mm -hmm. that kind of brought her back into her own writing, and uh, and then of course experimental film, which which is another. It's funny, like like the Only Good Indians is another, I think, contemporary classic, and mm -hmm. and uh, her stories have been appearing everywhere. She's another for me. She's another one of those. What we're talking about, you know, sort of must buy uh, readers. Yeah. I'm going to put you on solo for the to finish up that thought, and I'm going to be right back while you. Yeah, yeah, sure, me. sure. I'll, I'll uh, so also. Um, uh, Michael Cisco, the great Michael Cisco, has a new collection of stories coming out called Anti Societies, and uh, Cisco is—he's uh, a fantastic reader. If you've never seen Cisco read, um, look up a video of him reading. It's—it's—it's it's, uh, it's a fantastic experience. I, I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Li Elizabeth Hand is about the only other kind of performer reader that I think um, really hold a candle to, uh, to, to Cisco. He's, he's such, um, he's, he, he's, he's, he, he's so in habits, I, I guess I want to say, um, the, the stories that, that he's reading. But as a writer, he's, he's just an utterly, I, I mean, he's, he fits in with our whole weird crowd, but he is so much his own thing. Um, and he does what he does with um, just this astonishing integrity. You know, each book is different from from the book that came before, um, and it, it's it pleases me. I think I think actually, yeah, both both Michael's book and Gemma's book uh, are being put out by Grimscribe Press, mm. and good for them. That's that that's a strong yeah uh, a strong. Grimscribe, they're doing great. They're doing great work, and. Um, I'm really excited to read that Cisco collection. I um, I only saw Cisco read once, and it was at um, it was at a reading where you were reading as well. Uh, in um, in Queens, it was that uh, the yeah. ghost, the ghouls of Yule, and man, Cisco, you you're not you're not kidding by saying that that he really is his own beast. He has this real subtle, this real subtle thing going on where it's a lot of the a lot of it is in the body language and the facial expressions yeah, yeah, where, yeah. where suddenly you, suddenly you realize like you don't think like sometimes you see a performer, like there's some people who like um, Robert Shearman um, yeah, or some yeah, other people yeah. like they really you're like, Oh wow, this guy's a performer. You're like this guy's a pro Cisco. Would, like you, it's, it's very disarming and very subtle where then suddenly yeah. you realize how it's like that it is, that it is almost like a one man show <laughs> going on where he was reading that, uh, I don't know if it's a published story yet. He was reading. No, no, it's, story in, of... it's in this. It's in this collection. The one about the oh. the uh, the hand. The hand uh, of glory. Hand of glory. Yeah, like, hand of glory. And yeah, and like like and it was so sly. Fun. It was. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't like my humor. I'm like I don't like chocolate in my peanut butter. I don't like humor in my horror. But that was um, that had a sly humor to it. That just had me. That story was hypnotic. You know. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, no, he's, uh, he's a he's a great. Um, really underappreciated I, I feel underappreciated writer. I, I I don't know if this is true or not, but I feel like if we were in some civilized country like Cisco would be like everyone would know who he was and you know he would have some big university appointment and all this kind of stuff, you know. Further proof we are in the wrong timeline, right? Like of what <laughs> thanks again, Large Hadron Collider. Thanks again. Yeah. <laughs> 
somewhere there's another world where uh, right. there's another world where the election the turned out, uh, 2016 election turned out differently. Where, COVID where, where turned where out David out. Bowie and Prince are alive. And yes, they're all yes, <laughs> they're all there. Yeah, oh man. John, do you want to do you want to feel some? Well, should we we're getting near the two hour mark? Should we should we get near wrapping it up? Do you want to do we want to read some more? Do we want to ask more questions, or do we want to start uh, start wrapping it up? Well, let me. Uh, I would I would love to read the beginning of this uh, of this story by you, if if that's uh, yeah if that's yeah. Right. I'm 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 down to move into this hour here. I just wanted to check uh, check in with you and. Um, why don't why don't we read why don't you read a little bit from that of what whichever one it's gonna be and um and uh we'll see if we're feeling like I, we can read a little bit more from Fang. It uh so let's yeah. turn it over to you. Okay, so I'm, I'm getting to like this. I'm getting to like just the whole screen, you know. All right, all right. Back back to John. <laughs> so this is uh this is the first story um in Dan's collection. It, it's called uh, How to Stay Afloat When Drowning. And, and once again, I'm, I'm just going to read the first, um, you know, the first couple of pages of it. Montauk, New York. I figured slipping away to the bar would be a good way to escape the table's cringe-inducing conversation. But I can still see Uncle Roy and Allison laughing it up with the client and our hired boat captain among the litter of cracked lobster shells and half-eaten fish platters. The bartender sees me coming and is ready with another rum and coke. The night wind blows a gust of clean ocean air into the dock's aroma of, fi of fried food and cigarette smoke. Enough fishing talk for you, buddy, the bartender says over the miasma of tables full high season out-of-towners here for something the fast-paced Hamptons can't offer. He knocks on the wooden bar top and collects the dollar bills pinned under the tea light burning in a thick shot glass. I prefer my meals without talk of buckets of blood and guts, I say. Thank you very much. From over my shoulder, a laugh joins the murmur of lapping waves audible in the second before the next classic rock song kicks in on the tinny speakers. The bartender and I both turn to look at the woman on the stool next to me. She's in a long sundress and a green army surplus jacket, despite June's warmth. There's no makeup on her young face, but she doesn't come across as young. The way her lithe frame is comfortably parked on the bar stool speaks of years. I think there's something unusual about her forehead, but it's just the glow from the light strings hanging above the bar, flashing on and off her face. What's so funny? I ask. She's staring past me at the water. I don't think she's going to answer. Everyone knows the real way to chum for sharks is to cut yourself from nape to navel and let your guts spill out, she says. I expect her to laugh again or at least smile. She doesn't. The bartender winks at me and steps over to serve an old Italian man who's come up to the bar. We're uh, talking metaphorically here, right? I say. Spill, uh, as in spill into life, your life, my life, not into the water, right? Sure, yeah, sure, she says blankly. I feel like I've disappointed her and she's searching my face for a hint of the answer she wanted me to say. I know I should be uncomfortable with the way her gaze remains on me, but I'm flush with excitement. Come on, you know what I mean, she says. I don't know what she means, but I smile like I do. I'm not really one for chumming, I say. But you're bleeding all over the place. There's a splash from bait fish jumping below. You better look out. There may be sharks about, I half sing. It's her turn to smile at me with no idea of what I'm talking about. Sorry, but my singing's terrible. I, I know, I say. The real lyric is dogs, not sharks, though. Never mind. I get it, she says. Sharks smell blood like some people smell weakness. Oh, stop there. Oh, wow. Wow. Well, did you, did you catch the... Uh... Do you know the song that the song that's referencing? I do not actually. At least okay. I, I do. that's amazing. It's amazing. I mean, um, and, and I'm obviously I'm not the sort of person I say like, oh, you do you know that? Um, uh, as I hate it when people say, oh, you have you read this book? Because I haven't read any books, and so I like it when people are kind. But that is, um, it's a Pink Floyd. It's a Pink. It's a, it's him messing up a Pink. Oh, Floyd. okay. It's him okay. messing up dogs from from the animal CD. 
Oh, and he's I'll just uh it. so there's a line where it's like, you better watch out. There may be dogs about. You know? Oh, okay, all right, all right. No, I just thought it was just so awesome to just to see how um you know, if you uh, ask for bad singing, I can deliver bad. No, singing. you sang it though, man. It's just like uh, I, I think, I think, I think when you use when you use um, uh, music in a story, it has to work whether or not you know the reference. So I think, I think it's still. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think you delivered it, or at least I hope that I delivered it because you you delivered it. It was a pleasure to hear you read that. Thank you so much. Um, no, tell us, tell us about the story. Tell us about. I mean, I mean, this is you know, it's funny that you were talking about the aquatic themes and you were talking about the the surfboard and all this and and um and yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I feel like growing up um, in the seventies in, in this case, like you know, Jaws, right? Like like sharks, you know. Sharks have been a big part, I, I feel like, of, of our culture for, yeah, for like a half century almost or, or thereabouts because of the because of the movie and the attendant and, and all the movies that have come since that time, all the shark movies and, and all the concern with, um, actually, but, but ocean, like ocean horror stories, I mean, there's a much longer tradition of them, isn't there? So anyway, so, so what, what were you thinking? Yeah, no, there's a there's a huge tradition of them, and even and it's still going. Like, um, um, I think Ellen Ellen Datlow just put out uh, not very long ago the whole the whole anthology, is it Devil in the Deep Blue Sea, or yeah, um, yeah. A, an anthology of I think you and you have a story in that one, if I'm not. Uh, I do, if yeah, I'm mistaken. Yeah. Um, but um, you know, there was going back to what we were talking about when I took those first two books out. Uh, the two stories that are like number one and number two in in for me are um, the Jaguar Hunter by Lucia Shepard and um, and the other story that does it for me is called Because Their Skins Are Finer by Tanith Lee. Okay. Um, and that was in that was in Dreams of Dark and Light. Um, it turns out that's a Selkie story, but I didn't know what a Selkie was when I read it, and it's another another repentant hunter so i mean i think ultimately the first inklings the first inklings of an idea i wanted i wanted to write i wanted to write because their skins are finer i mean i just wanted to write that story but but not write that story yeah yeah and, sure um and the story was me trying to find my me trying to find my way in writing um knowing i wanted to write write a story that dealt with the violence of hunting without being on the nose. Right? right. So, I mean, um, that was, that was the pantsing part, right? That was the part that when you have something that's, that's clawing at you, clawing at you, clawing at you, and how does it eventually become into a story? So the things, you know, things that I had experienced in life was, um, yeah, like seeing, seeing, you know, some of the memories that people have, were real things like seeing seeing the shark taken out of the surf and being beaten, of seeing seeing the way that um, um, being there, seeing the way a shark is killed, and just the absolute the absolute violence of that. And um, so that was the pants part, and then the craft part or the the planning part was just meticulously going over and over and like oh, how. How do you fit that into dramatic structure that's not cliche? Like I think I think the worst thing I think the worst thing for me as a reader is when I feel, of course, when I'm being hit over the head with with an idea or even being remotely nudged with it. You know, I mean, when you when you want to, I think the, the worst thing you can do when you want to get something across intentionally in a story is to um, to do it intentionally. And what I what I what I mean by that is like, okay. The worst thing to do to make someone feel the violence or make to, to feel that that violence against the sharks is wrong would be to 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 put them to put them over the head with it, you know. So yeah, that, sure. that's part of my process and how I'm making like okay, well, that that will inform the choices of who these characters are and what what the lens is um, I'm seeing them through. So yeah, so that's so that's how that how. Um, how that came about. Um, some of the other things like, yeah, like uh, when you put them up in a mirror up against um, some of the other, the other stories in the book, you realize, wow, okay, maybe I didn't really intend this to be, okay, it's another water story or another, uh, another, 
another story with surf, you know. Um, yeah, I was yeah. at a read, I was at a reader con and, and Tim Powers, someone was showing like the endings of his books to him, and they said, Tim, is this another ending of a book where two people get in a boat and go across the lake? And he's like, Really? How many times how many times did I do that? I didn't mean to right. <laughs> there's a great there's a great novel uh by David Lodge. Um Oh man, I'm trying to think. He, he's is a sort of loose trilogy. He's an English writer who writes these kind of you know comedies and and um, small world, I think it is. Anyway, and there's this one writer and this guy has run a uh, has like done a sort of computer analysis of his of his prose, and he sort of mapped out the words that he uses in his prose, and it like paralyzes the guy because he's like, oh. ah, you know, it. Uh, um, whereas, yeah, I I I don't know. Anyway. Yeah, it, it's funny though because the <laughs> personal, like, this is a small anecdote. You know, when when my son was small, we used to watch the Croc Hunter, uh, who <laughs> would do all this conservation stuff, right? And one of them, he was out in a, they were out in a, a boat not too far off the the Australian coast, and they discovered a shark that had um, its fins had been cut from it, and then it had just been left to die. Um, and it's part of making shark fin soup, and he was outraged my son he was just he was he was so offended and he was in first grade and he went up to his room and he wrote this angry poem and he went wow. into school the next day and before anything could get going he was like i have something i need to read and he got <laughs> up and, and read this poem and the teacher was just like whoa you know but it's uh it's offensive it's it's offensive well and there's something that's kind of fascinating I feel like by, uh, or, or uh, how do I put this? It's something I, I think that, that's fascinating to me about what you do in the story about making the shark sympathetic, you know, making the the, the predator. Because, you know, we, I kind of feel like with, uh, with wolves, right? I, I mean, a wolf could be really frightening if a wolf were galloping towards you. But they're cute. They're like dogs. They're like German shepherds. Sharks, man, you know, there's just, like, like, like we, um, Maybe because of Jaws, you know, Quint's monologue about the dead eyes and all this kind of stuff. But but I feel like we really see them that way. You know, we 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 see them as just these frightening creatures that that just all they want to do is eat us. And and it it's um and and I gather that's you know that's not the case. So there, there's something that's interesting about extending sympathy um, to 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 the monstrous, if you will. You know. Yeah, I, yeah. In Tanithley's um, in T in Tanithley's story, because their skins are finer, um, it's a story of a repentant fisherman, a repentant seal hunter, right? So he he's a seal hunter, and these seal hunts are very brutal, right? Killing a seal, like you're you you are beating this sentient, breathing, cute animal to death, and this yeah. is a guy, an elderly um, fisherman who is now repentant and just living his life away from it. And one night, the uh, it's either the husband or the wife of the Selkie that he killed comes to comes comes to pay his um, um, comes to give him his comeuppance, you know, um, so um, but I didn't want to have that dynamic. But yeah, you can play around with um, um, playing around with expectations and sympathies, I think, um, I think it's really hard to do, um, but um, it's satisfying when you you're able when you're able to um, uh, to pull it off, right? And have have a have a mythology or have a rules or having things operating in a certain way. Um, so so um, different elements sit sit into some different roles. Yeah, yeah, they, they assume a sort of different and and it's I think that the temptation right is just to flip it, you know, like like and and I think that's and that doesn't even that doesn't even work out, right? You know, it has to having it to be in shades of gray like a Scorsese character of like yeah, okay. I mean, there's there's still there's still murder and there's still death in here, but it's like it's almost like um uh the anti-hero or the lovable rogue or, you know, the lovable <laughs> villain in some way, right? Like, you know, there's some um, people, like, what do people like? You know, I'm, 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 everything comes back to Kelly Link for me. Like, Kelly Link is like, okay, yeah, we still, maybe we like people who are the best. Maybe we like people who play by the rules. Maybe we like people who break the rules, right? So, like, even if we still have these sharks, 
Like there were rules of sharks going on in this story. Right, right, <laughs> right. It's like right, your, that can either that can either appeal to you or or not appeal to you. So your Scorsese remark made me think of like now Joe Pesci is a shark. You know, do I yeah. amuse you? You know, do you yeah. think I swim funny? <laughs> Am I swimming <laughs> funny? Is this too? <laughs> oh man. Well, speaking of fangs, um, before we wrap it up, do you want to um? I want to read a little bit from your title story and ask you about it, Children of the Fang. How's that sound? Sure, absolutely. Okay, so you, can, um, you take you take the screen, wipe me out. I'm yeah. gonna take I'm gonna take the screen, and we'll, we'll do screen. we'll do our dance party uh, right here. So yeah, before we wrap it up, um, again, this is John's latest collection, Children of the Fang and other genealogies, and uh, I wanted to read from the title story again. I'm I'm on. Um, I'm just really on this kick of just showing how John, he tells the stories within the story. So if you haven't read the title story yet, Children of the Fang, it's actually a remarkable story for reasons other than I'm going to point out right now. But what, one of the remarkable things going on in this very fun and unique story is um, there's a the character of the grandpa. <laughs> so there's these, it's told from the point of view of these two kids and they live with or near their grandpa who is just this He's just this mysterious guy. He's like a, a crotchety, uh, mysterious guy. But you, you, throughout the whole story, you get the sense that right there's something weird. There's something weird about him, where he's holding a mystery, and that mystery has to do with an ice chest that Grandpa guards. But um, at one point, we get some of the backstory of Grandpa. Or Grandpa tells tells this story so the kids uh the kids think they're in deep shit like they're like oh man they got busted for something and they think they're in deep shit and after they've had their punishment their grandfather's like okay come here kids i want to tell you something and this is this is the story within the story it's too long to read all of it but i'll just read a taste of what what's what's going on here okay so it's from children of the fang by john langan grandpa seated himself and said the two of you are in a heap of trouble. It's your parents' right to raise you as they see fit. And there's not anyone can say or do about it. It's how I was with my boys, and I won't grant your dad any less with you. Joshua, they don't take too kindly to you walloping the one girl and trying for the other. And Rachel, they're tarring you with some of the same brush in case you had anything to do with putting your brother up to it. These days, folks tend to take a dim view of one youngster raising his hand against another, especially if it's a girl. Your dad would say I'm wrong. Times have changed. But rest assured, if those had been two boys you've gone after, the tone of the recent discussions you've been involved in would have been different. I can't intervene with your parents, but there's nothing that says I can't have a few words with you. So when I was a tad older than the two of you, I went everywhere and did everything with my cousin, Julius Augustus. Some name, I know. It was the smartest thing about him. I expect your folks would call him developmentally delayed or some such. We said he was slow. He was four years older, but he sat through ninth grade with me. It was his third time. After two tries at the grade before, he'd wanted to quit school and find a job, maybe on his uncle's farm, but Julius's dad fancied himself an educated man, which I guess you might have guessed from the names he loaded on his son, and he could not believe a child of his would not possess the same aptitude for learning as himself. Once I'd moved on to 10th grade and Julius had been invited to give Ninth another try, his father relented and allowed him to ask his uncle about that job. Julius's dad, Roy, was my uncle by marriage. His family owned a farm a couple of miles up the road from where I lived, had a big house set atop a knob from which they looked down on the rest of us. They'd been fairly scandalized when Roy took a liking to Aunt Allison, who was my mom's middle sister. But Roy had proved more stubborn than the rest of his family. And in the end, his father had granted Roy and Allison a piece of land, which ran along one bank of the stream that swung around the foot of the hill. Julius Augustus was their only child who lived, and if folks judged it ironic that a man of Roy's intellectual pretensions found himself with a boy who had trouble with the Sunday funnies, none of them denied the sweetness of Julius's temperament. You could say or do nigh on anything to him, and the most it would provoke was a frown. 
It let him get along at his uncle's, which had been his grandfather's, until the old man's heart had burst. The grandfather hadn't been what you'd call kind to his laborers, but he had been fair. His elder son, Roy's brother, Rick, was less consistent. Not long after his father's death, Rick had sunk a fair portion of the farm's money into a project he'd been talking up for years. He bought a small herd of French cattle, the breed was called. He'd seen them when he was serving in France, what we still call the Great War. Bigger cattle, heavier, more meat on them, cream colored. Rick had a notion they would give him an advantage over the local competition. So he returned to France, found some animals he liked, and a farmer willing to sell them and arranged to have his white cattle shipped across the Atlantic. This was no easy task, not least because the Great Depression still had the country in its claws. More than a few palms wanted crossing with silver, and then a couple of the cows sickened and died on the journey. The carolais that arrived took to the farm well enough, but Rick had imagined that. As soon as they were grazing his fields, everything was going to happen overnight, which of course it didn't. The great sea of white cattle, he pictured, needed time to establish itself. I guess some folk, including Roy, tried telling him this. But Rick would not, maybe could not accept it. After another pair of the Carolus died their first summer, Rick decided it was because they hadn't been eating the best grass. Anyone could see that the grass all over the farm and all around the farm was pretty much the same. But Rick got it in his head that the grazing would make his herd prosper lay on the su Rick got it in his head that the grazing that would make his herd prosper lay on the far side of the stream and snaked around the base of their family's hill, where Roy, Allison, and Julius had their home. Had he asked Roy to allow, to allow the cattle to feed on his land, his brother might have agreed. Rick demanded, though, said it was his right as an elder son and heir to the farm to do what was best for it. Roy didn't argue his authority over what happened on the farm but he said his property was his property, granted him fair and square by their father, and the first one of those white cows he caught on his side of the stream was gonna get shot, as were any subsequent trespassers. As you might expect, this did not go down so well with Rick. Um, and the story, the story goes on. I'm just, I'm just so, I was just so captivated by that story within a story um, there. Um, it, um, it's not directly onto the plot. It, it's not like there, it doesn't directly influence um, the plot, but it informs the it informs the characters so well. And it, and it's a heart it's a heartbreaking short story within the short story. It's so satisfying with the beginning, middle, and end. Um, where where did you get that one from, John? Is that something that you, you made up, or did you hear that from somewhere, or did you you build it together, um, or did the magician never show his tricks? Yeah, it's it's um, when I was um, an undergrad and um, uh, doing um, a master's degree at at, at SUNY New Paltz, um, I studied a lot of of the literature of the American South, um, Faulkner, but but also um, Robert Penn Warren, um, who um, I guess Warren's most famous novel is probably All the King's Men, um, but he also wrote a lot of poetry and and such and. Um, so anyway, I, I went to different literary conferences in um, in Kentucky, uh, some out west in Bowling Green and, and others in Springfield and the more eastern part of the state. And um, I had friends, uh, um, former faculty, uh, former teachers who, who went to some of those conferences. So yeah, I heard all kinds of stories um, from them and about uh, from other people at these conferences and, and about... Um, just about what life was like um, in in different parts of uh, in different parts of Kentucky, and it's you know it's it's a weird thing that the the landscape of Kentucky is is one of the few landscapes I've I've dreamed about over and over again, um, and it affected me on on this very deep kind of primordial kind of level. I would say probably more eastern Kentucky, where there are these little domed mountains that they call the Kentucky the the knobs. And and I'm sure I used to know what the what the explanation for them was. And I, I don't remember at the at the moment. But um yeah, I, I kind of wanted just the the story um that, that suggested itself was just this kind of family story and and um um, because it's his story, the the grandfather's story is is to a certain extent paralleled with the a monster sort of story that that mm -hmm. the grandfather was involved with, and um, 
yeah the the for whatever reason i i just thought that that the um the i i was going to use all this kentucky material that i that i had a lot of my stuff is set in and around the hudson valley the catskills um this is this is my little postage stamp of of soil but you know every now and again um you're like hey i'd like to do something with this particular location that i have and and um this uh, this seemed like an opportunity to to do that and i guess also like along the way kind of pay tribute to warren and faulkner and flannery o'connor and Catherine ann porter you know these these writers um who who uh who were and who, who continue to be important to me yeah as someone who doesn't know those influences it it really added a weight um and a verisimilitude to the story like if I if I didn't if I didn't believe it before that part, which I did, I sure as hell believed in Grandpa. You know, like it's just like right, right. You know, like, wow, like this is when characters are doing things that are unexpected but still feel um, true to their character and feel real. Like you know, like I'm hanging right on this story. You know, like where where, where something very fantastic is happening in the story, but it's grounded. It's grounded in such a such a present scene. We're like, wow, all right, these kids are in trouble now. Grandpa's gonna sit him down and tell so, when I was a kid. <laughs> right, 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 right. And, and the story, the story is heartbreaking. I found the story to be heartbreaking and tragic, and wasn't quite sure why he's lecturing the kids with that particular one. It's just adding to the slow burn of dread on that story. And I just, I found that a really, really well done aspect to it. So, Thank you. There's, there's uh, something yeah. to me that's kind of fascinating about. Um, about really exploring a character, I guess, about, about really trying to map the interior of a, of a character, or at least some of the interior of the character. And, and I guess in, in part, because the grandfather has done some pretty terrible things, I, I, was, I was looking to kind of, I guess to a certain extent, to sketch out a psychology that would allow you to do those things, you know, that, the, um, and um and so i think that was i think that was that was part of it probably you know was was i'm thinking oh my god so this guy does this particular or or, or these this sort of series of things that are really awful who would do such a thing and it was like you know sort of like like working backwards you and know? It's, even, yeah, it's, it's even more tragic to see someone who has tragedy in their past and succumb to it in a way and that didn't right like there are plenty of there are plenty of stories of people who've had incredibly oppressive pasts and still became awesome people. And right. And then there are stories where bad shit happens to people and they do bad things. Too. Yeah. It kind of breaks them. Yeah. 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 So um, yeah. Children the title story, children of the fang and the title story of children of the fang and other genealogies. It's out now from word to word. And that's the note, that's the message. If we can if we can leave one message with anyone still with us is that don't let those bad things break you, <laughs> right? I mean- No, uh, no, the message we wanna leave is buy our books. That's oh, right, sorry, right. We went over books. this, man, it's marketing. It's all marketing, it's branding, come on. Oh <laughs> my God. All right, we're gonna have to do this show over again, everybody. Just Dude, Wait a minute, I didn't hit record. We're gonna- uh, <laughs> Oh, no. John, you remember everything you said, right? Pretty Let's much. Just do it. Yeah, pretty Hi. much. Yeah. I'm I'm John Langan. You might know me from <laughs> well, John, it's been an absolute it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Um thank you yeah. and thank you to thank you to our audience. Thank you to everybody yeah. who uh who hung in there. We Yeah, we, after we, I hit and stick around after I end the broadcast. We'll uh, stick around, don't rush off, but thanks to everyone who came and uh right, thank you so much. Check out uh Children of the Fang uh from Word Horde, that's out now, and uh, Underworld Dreams is out now from Levee Press. So, um, <laughs> don't let anything break your resolve to buy our books. Absolutely, take, that's yeah, yeah. I'll take, I'll take my my attempt, my feeble attempt at uh, at a uh, inspirational feel good phrase. We'll turn it into capitalism. No, but seriously, thanks so yeah. much. For, <laughs> thanks so much for for hanging out, and uh, yeah, John. Thank you. Uh, before we go, anything, um, any, um, uh, anything coming up for you? Anything coming up? Uh, where can we see you next? 
Uh, I don't know. Actually, I think I think this is uh, this is what I have scheduled for the for the moment. I'm glad we got the chance to hang out like this and and just okay. talk for a while. Um, I uh, you and I have talked about uh, you and I have talked about some stuff that we might do in the future for some yeah. things. Yeah. So so maybe that'll happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think I'll be at Virtual Reader Con uh, this okay. year. That um, and. Uh, I probably, I imagine there'll be some other virtual things, you know, coming up that uh, that I'll be attending, um, and then hopefully we'll all have our vaccines, and next year we can all get back to, um, we can all get back to to meeting yeah. in person, you know. It'll be great to see everyone. Yeah, I see. Um, yeah, but sh thank you uh, for this. A lot of fine writers who are in uh, in the chat there. Thank you to all the writers here. I see, I see Emma Gibbon is actually here, and uh, I have an event. Um, just want to shout out, um, I've been invited to event, uh, virtual event March 27th. Um, Emma is going to be one of the readers, and um, there's going to be a lot of uh, some horror readers there, so I'm really happy to uh, be a part of that. And we will see everyone when we see you. We'll see everybody soon. Stay safe. Stay safe, Stay everybody. Safe. Have a good night. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you so much.